Section 1 of Selected Classics of Washington Irving. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Selected Classics of Washington Irving by Washington Irving Section 1 Rip Van Winkle Part 1 A Posthumous Writing of Diedrich Knickerbocker By Woden, God of Saxons, from whence comes Wednesday, that is, Woden's Day. Truth is a thing that ever I will keep unto thy like day in which I creep into my sepulchre. Cartwright The following tale was found among the papers of the late Diedrich Knickerbocker, an old gentleman of New York, who was very curious in the Dutch history of the province and the manners of the descendants from its primitive settlers. His historical researches, however, did not lie so much among books as among men, for the former are lamentably scanty on his favorite topics, whereas he found the old burghers, and still more their wives, rich in that legendary lore, so invaluable to true history. Whenever, therefore, he happened upon a genuine Dutch family, snugly shut up in its low-roofed farmhouse, under a spreading sycamore. He looked upon it as a little clasped volume of black letter, and studied it with the zeal of a bookworm. The result of all these researches was a history of the province, during the reign of the Dutch governors which he published some years since. There have been various opinions as to the literary character of his work, and, to tell the truth, it is not a whit better than it should be. Its chief merit is its scrupulous accuracy, which indeed was a little questioned on its first appearance, but has since been completely established and it is now admitted into all historical collections as a book of unquestionable authority. The old gentleman died shortly after the publication of his work, and now that he is dead and gone, it cannot do much harm to his memory to say that his time might have been much better employed in weightier labors. He, however, was apt to ride his hobby his own way and though it did now and then kick up the dust a little in the eyes of his neighbors, and grieve the spirit of some friends, for whom he felt the truest deference and affection, yet his errors and follies are remembered more in sorrow than in anger, and it begins to be suspected that he never intended to injure or offend. But however his memory may be appreciated by critics, it is still held dear among many folks, whose good opinion is well worth having, particularly by certain biscuit bakers, who have gone so far as to imprint his likeness on their New Year cakes, and have thus given him a chance for immortality, almost equal to the being stamped on a Waterloo medal or a Queen Anne's farthing. Whoever has made a voyage up the Hudson must remember the Catskill Mountains. They are a dismembered branch of the great Appalachian family, and are seen away to the west of the river, swelling up to a noble height, and lording it over the surrounding country. Every change of season, every change of weather, indeed, every hour of the day, produces some change in the magical hues and shapes of these mountains and they are regarded by all the good wives, far and near, as perfect barometers. When the weather is fair and settled, they are clothed in blue and purple, 
and print their bold outlines on the clear evening sky. But sometimes, when the rest of the landscape is cloudless, they will gather a hood of gray vapors about their summits, which, in the last rays of the setting sun, will glow and light up like a crown of glory. At the foot of these fairy mountains, the voyager may have decried the light smoke curling up from a village, whose shingle roofs gleam among the trees, just where the blue tints of the upland melt away into the fresh green of the nearer landscape. It is a little village of great antiquity, having been founded by some of the Dutch colonists in the early times of the province, just about the beginning of the government of the good Peter Stuyvesant. May he rest in peace. And there were some of the houses of the original settlers, standing within a few years, built of small yellow bricks, brought from Holland, having latticed windows and gable fronts, surmounted with weathercocks. In that same village, and in one of these very houses, which, to tell the precise truth, was sadly time-worn and weather-beaten, there lived, many years since, while the country was yet a province of Great Britain, a simple, good-natured fellow, of the name of Rip Van Winkle. He was a descendant of the Van Winkles, who figured so gallantly in the chivalrous days of Peter Stuyvesant, and accompanied him to the siege of Fort Christina. He inherited, however, but little of the martial character of his ancestors. I have observed that he was a simple, good-natured man. He was, moreover, a kind neighbor, and an obedient, henpecked husband. Indeed, to the latter circumstance, might be owing that meekness of spirit which gained him such universal popularity. For those men are apt to be obsequious and conciliating abroad, who are under the discipline of shrews at home. Their tempers, doubtless, are rendered pliant and malleable in the fiery furnace of domestic tribulation, and a curtain lecture is worth all the sermons in the world for teaching the virtues of patience and long-suffering. A termagant wife may, therefore, in some respects, be considered a tolerable blessing, and if so, Rip Van Winkle was thrice blessed. Certain it is that he was a great favorite among all the good wives of the village, who, as usual with the amiable sex, took his part in all family squabbles, and never failed, whenever they talked those matters over in their evening gossipings, to lay all the blame on Dame Van Winkle. The children of the village, too, would shout with joy whenever he approached. He assisted at their sports, made their playthings, taught them to fly kites and shoot marbles, and told them long stories of ghosts, witches, and Indians. Whenever he went dodging about the village, he was surrounded by a troop of them hanging on his skirts, clambering on his back, and playing a thousand tricks on him with impunity. And not a dog would bark at him throughout the neighborhood. The great error in Rip's composition was an insuperable aversion to all kinds of profitable labor. It could not be for want of assiduity or perseverance, for he would sit on a wet rock, with a rod as long and heavy as a tartar's lance, and fish all day without a murmur, even though he should not be encouraged by a single nibble. He would carry a fowling piece on his shoulder for hours together, trudging through woods and swamps, and up hill and down dale, to shoot a few squirrels or wild pigeons. He would never refuse to assist a neighbor, even in the roughest toil, and was a foremost man in all country frolics for husking Indian corn or building stone fences. The women of the village, too, used to employ him to run their errands, and to do such little odd jobs as their less obliging husbands would not do for them. In a word, 
Rip was ready to attend to anybody's business but his own. But as to doing family duty and keeping his farm in order, he found it impossible. In fact, he declared it was of no use to work on his farm. It was the most pestilent little piece of ground in the whole country. Everything about it went wrong, in spite of him. His fences were continually falling to pieces. His cow would either go astray, or get among the cabbages. Weeds were sure to grow quicker in his fields than anywhere else. The rain always made a point of setting in just as he had some outdoor work to do, so that though his patrimonial estate had dwindled away under his management, acre by acre, until there was little more left than a mere patch of Indian corn and potatoes, yet it was the worst-conditioned farm in the neighborhood. His children, too, were as ragged and wild as if they belonged to nobody. His son, Rip, an urchin begotten in his own likeness, promised to inherit the habits with the old clothes of his father. He was generally seen trooping like a colt at his mother's heels, equipped in a pair of his father's cast-off galligaskins, which he had much ado to hold up with one hand, as a fine lady does her train in bad weather. Rip Van Winkle, however, was one of those happy mortals of foolish, well-oiled dispositions, who take the world easy, eat white bread or brown, whichever can be got with least thought or trouble, and would rather starve on a penny than work for a pound. If left to himself, he would have whistled life away, in perfect contentment. But his wife kept continually dunning in his ears about his idleness, his carelessness, and the ruin he was bringing on his family. Morning, noon, and night, her tongue was incessantly going, and everything he said or did was sure to produce a torrent of household eloquence. Rip had but one way of replying to all lectures of the kind, and that, by frequent use, had grown into a habit. He shrugged his shoulders, shook his head, cast up his eyes, but said nothing. This, however, always provoked a fresh volley from his wife so that he was fain to draw off his forces, and take to the outside of the house, the only side which, in truth, belongs to a henpecked husband. Rip's sole domestic adherent was his dog Wolf, who was as much henpecked as his master, for Dame Van Winkle regarded them as companions in idleness, and even looked upon Wolf with an evil eye as the cause of his master's going so often astray. True it is, in all points of spirit befitting an honorable dog, he was as courageous an animal as ever scoured the woods. But what courage can withstand the evil doing and all besetting terrors of a woman's tongue? The moment Wolf entered the house, his crest fell, his tail drooped to the ground, or curled between his legs. He sneaked about with a gallows air, casting many a sidelong glance at Dame Van Winkle, and at the least flourish of a broomstick or ladle, he would fly to the door with yelping precipitation. Times grew worse and worse with Rip Van Winkle, as years of matrimony rolled on. A tart temper never mellows with age, and a sharp tongue is the only edged tool that grows keener with constant use. For a long while he used to console himself, when driven from home, by frequenting a kind of perpetual club of the sages, philosophers, and other idle personages of the village, which held its sessions on a bench before a small inn, designated by a rubicund portrait of His Majesty George the Third. Here they used to sit in the shade through a long, lazy summer's day, talking listlessly over village gossip, or telling endless, sleepy stories about nothing. But it would have been worth any statesman's money to have heard the profound discussions which sometimes took place, when by chance, 
an old newspaper fell into their hands from some passing traveller how solemnly they would listen to the contents as drawled out by derrick von bummel the schoolmaster a dapper learned little man who was not to be daunted by the most gigantic word in the dictionary and how sagely they would deliberate upon public events some months after they had taken place the opinions of this junto were completely controlled by nicholas vedder a patriarch of the village and landlord of the inn at the door of which he took his seat from morning till night just moving sufficiently to avoid the sun and keep in the shade of a large tree so that the neighbors could tell the hour by his movements as accurately as by a sundial it is true he was rarely heard to speak but smoked his pipe incessantly his adherents however for every great man has his adherents perfectly understood him and knew how to gather his opinions when anything that was read or related displeased him he was observed to smoke his pipe vehemently and to send forth frequent and angry puffs but when pleased he would inhale the smoke slowly and tranquilly and emit it in light and placid clouds and sometimes taking the pipe from his mouth and letting the fragrant vapor curl about his nose would gravely nod his head in token of perfect approbation from even this stronghold the unlucky rip was at length routed by his termagant wife who would suddenly break in upon the tranquillity of the assemblage and call the members all to naught nor was that august personage nicholas vedder himself sacred from the daring tongue of this terrible virago who charged him outright with encouraging her husband in habits of idleness poor rip was at last reduced almost to despair and his only alternative to escape from the labor of the farm and the clamor of his wife was to take gun in hand and stroll away into the woods here he would sometimes seat himself at the foot of a tree and share the contents of his wallet with wolf with whom he sympathized as a fellow sufferer in persecution poor wolf he would say thy mistress leads thee a dog's life of it but never mind my lad whilst i live thou shalt never want a friend to stand by thee wolf would wag his tail look wistfully in his master's face and if dogs can feel pity i verily believe he reciprocated the sentiment with all his heart in a long ramble of the kind on a fine autumnal day rip had unconsciously scrambled to one of the highest parts of the catskill mountains he was after his favorite sport of squirrel shooting and the still solitudes had echoed and re-echoed with the reports of his gun panting and fatigued he threw himself late in the afternoon on a green knoll covered with mountain herbage that crowned the brow of a precipice from an opening between the trees he could overlook all the lower country for many a mile of rich woodland he saw at a distance the lordly hudson far far below him moving on its silent but majestic course with the reflection of a purple cloud or the sail of a lagging bark here and there sleeping on its glassy bosom and at last losing itself in the blue highlands on the other side he looked down into a deep mountain glen wild lonely and shagged the bottom filled with fragments from the impending cliffs and scarcely lighted by the reflected rays of the setting sun for some time rip lay musing on the scene evening was gradually advancing the mountains began to throw their long blue shadows over the valleys he saw that it would be dark long before he could reach the village and he heaved a heavy sigh when he thought of encountering the terrors of dame van winkle as he was about to descend he heard a voice from a distance hallowing 
rip van winkle rip van winkle he looked around but could see nothing but a crow winging its solitary flight across the mountain he thought his fancy must have deceived him and turned again to descend when he heard the same cry ring through the still evening air rip van winkle rip van winkle at the same time wolf bristled up his back and giving a low growl skulked to his master's side looking fearfully down into the glen rip now felt a vague apprehension stealing over him he looked anxiously in the same direction and perceived the strange figure slowly toiling up the rocks and bending under the weight of something he carried on his back he was surprised to see any human being in this lonely and unfrequented place but supposing it to be some one of the neighborhood in need of his assistance he hastened down to yield it on nearer approach he was still more surprised at the singularity of the stranger's appearance he was a short square-built old fellow with thick bushy hair and a grizzled beard his dress was of the antique dutch fashion a cloth jerkin strapped around the waist several pairs of breeches the outer one of ample volume decorated with rows of buttons down the sides and bunches at the knees he bore on his shoulders a stout keg that seemed full of liquor and made signs for rip to approach and assist him with the load though rather shy and distrustful of this new acquaintance rip complied with his usual alacrity and mutually relieving each other they clambered up a narrow gully apparently the dry bed of a mountain torrent as they ascended rip every now and then heard long rolling peals like distant thunder that seemed to issue out of a deep ravine or rather cleft between lofty rocks toward which their ragged path conducted he paused for an instant but supposing it to be the muttering of one of those transient thunder showers which often take place in the mountain heights he proceeded passing through the ravine they came to a hollow like a small amphitheatre surrounded by perpendicular precipices over the brinks of which impending trees shot their branches so that you only caught glimpses of the azure sky and the bright evening cloud during the whole time rip and his companion had labored on in silence for though the former marveled greatly what could be the object of carrying a keg of liquor up this wild mountain yet there was something strange and incomprehensible about the unknown that inspired awe and checked familiarity on entering the amphitheatre new objects of wonder presented themselves on a level spot in the centre was a company of odd-looking personages playing at ninepins they were dressed in quaint outlandish fashion some wore short doublets others jerkins with long knives in their belts and most of them had enormous breeches of similar style with that of the guides their visages too were peculiar one had a large head broad face and small piggish eyes the face of another seemed to consist entirely of nose and was surmounted by a white sugar-loaf hat set off with a little red cock's tail they all had beards of various shapes and colors there was one who seemed to be the commander he was a stout old gentleman with a weather-beaten countenance he wore a laced doublet broad belt and hanger high-crowned hat and feather red stockings and high-heeled shoes with roses in them the whole group reminded rip of the figures in an old flemish painting in the parlor of dominique van schaik the village parson and which had been brought over from holland at the time of the settlement what seemed particularly odd to rip was that though these folks were evidently amusing themselves yet they maintained the gravest faces the most mysterious silence and wore withal the most melancholy party of pleasure 
he had ever witnessed. Nothing interrupted the stillness of the scene but the noise of the balls, which, whenever they were rolled, echoed along the mountains like rumbling peals of thunder. As Rip and his companion approached them, they suddenly desisted from their play, and stared at him with such a fixed statue-like gaze, and such strange uncouth lack-luster countenances, that his heart turned within him, and his knees smote together. His companion now emptied the contents of the keg into large flagons, and made signs to him to wait upon the company. He obeyed with fear and trembling. They quaffed the liquor in profound silence, and then returned to their game. By degrees, Rip's awe and apprehension subsided. He even ventured, when no eye was fixed upon him, to taste the beverage which he found had much of the flavor of excellent Hollands. He was naturally a thirsty soul, and was soon tempted to repeat the draught. One taste provoked another, and he reiterated his visits to the flagon so often that at length his senses were overpowered, his eyes swam in his head, his head gradually declined, and he fell into a deep sleep. End of Section 1 Rip Van Winkle Part 1 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section 2 of Selected Classics of Washington Irving by Washington Irving This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano Section 2 Rip Van Winkle Part 2 On waking, he found himself on the green knoll whence he had first seen the old man of the glen. He rubbed his eyes. It was a bright, sunny morning. The birds were hopping and twittering among the bushes, and the eagle was wheeling aloft, and breasting the pure mountain breeze. Surely, thought Rip, I have not slept here all night. He recalled the occurrences before he fell asleep. The strange man with the keg of liquor, the mountain ravine, the wild retreat among the rocks, the woe-begone party at nine pins, the flagon. Oh, that flagon, that wicked flagon, thought Rip. What excuse shall I make to Dame Van Winkle? He looked round for his gun, but in place of the clean, well-oiled fowling piece, he found an old firelock lying by him, the barrel encrusted with rust, the lock falling off, and the stock worm-eaten. He now suspected that the grave roisterers of the mountains had put a trick upon him, and having dosed him with liquor, had robbed him of his gun. Wolf, too, had disappeared, but he might have strayed away after a squirrel or partridge. He whistled after him, and shouted his name, but all in vain. The echoes repeated his whistle and shout, but no dog was to be seen. He determined to revisit the scene of the last evening's gamble, and if he met with any of the party, to demand his dog and gun. As he rose to walk, he found himself stiff in the joints, and wanting in his usual activity. These mountain beds do not agree with me, thought Rip, and if this frolic should lay me up with a fit of the rheumatism, I shall have a blessed time with Dame Van Winkle. With some difficulty he got down into the glen. He found the gully up which he and his companion had ascended the preceding evening. But to his astonishment, a mountain stream was now foaming down it, leaping from rock to rock, and filling the glen with babbling murmurs. He, however, made shift to scramble up its sides, working his toilsome way through the thickets of birch, sassafras, and witch-hazel, and sometimes tripped up 
or entangled by the wild grapevines that twisted their coils and tendrils from tree to tree and spread a kind of network in his path at length he reached to where the ravine had opened through the cliffs to the amphitheatre but no traces of such opening remained the rocks presented a high impenetrable wall over which the torrent came tumbling in a sheet of feathery foam and fell into a broad deep basin black from the shadows of the surrounding forest here then poor rip was brought to a stand he again called and whistled after his dog he was only answered by the cawing of a flock of idle crows sporting high in the air about a dry tree that overhung a sunny precipice and who secure in their elevation seemed to look down and scoff at the poor man's perplexities what was to be done the morning was passing away and rip felt famished for want of his breakfast he grieved to give up his dog and gun he dreaded to meet his wife but it would not do to starve among the mountains he shook his head shouldered the rusty firelock and with a heart full of trouble and anxiety turned his steps homeward as he approached the village he met a number of people but none of whom he knew which somewhat surprised him for he had thought himself acquainted with every one in the country round their dress too was of a different fashion from that to which he was accustomed they all stared at him with equal marks of surprise and whenever they cast eyes upon him invariably stroked their chins the constant recurrence of this gesture induced rip involuntarily to do the same when to his astonishment he found his beard had grown a foot long he had now entered the skirts of the village a troop of strange children ran at his heels hooting after him and pointing at his gray beard the dogs too not one of which he recognized for an old acquaintance barked at him as he passed the very village was altered it was larger and more populous there were rows of houses which he had never seen before and those which had been his familiar haunts had disappeared strange names were over the doors strange faces at the windows everything was strange his mind now misgave him he began to doubt whether both he and the world around him were not bewitched surely this was his native village which he had left but a day before there stood the catskill mountains there ran the silver hudson at a distance there was every hill and dale precisely as it had always been rip was sorely perplexed that flagon last night thought he has addled my poor head sadly it was with some difficulty that he found the way to his own house which he approached with silent awe expecting every moment to hear the shrill voice of dame van winkle he found the house gone to decay the roof had fallen in the windows shattered and the doors off the hinges a half-starved dog that looked like wolf was skulking about it rip called him by name but the cur snarled showed his teeth and passed on this was an unkind cut indeed my very dog sighed poor rip has forgotten me he entered the house which to tell the truth dame van winkle had always kept in neat order it was empty forlorn and apparently abandoned the desolateness overcame all his connubial fears he called loudly for his wife and children the lonely chambers rang for a moment with his voice and then all again was silence he now hurried forth and hastened to his old resort the village inn but it too was gone a large rickety wooden building stood in its place with great gaping windows some of them broken and mended with old hats and petticoats and over the door was painted the union hotel by jonathan doolittle 
instead of the great tree that used to shelter the quiet little dutch inn of yore there now was reared a tall naked pole with something on the top that looked like a red nightcap and from it was fluttering a flag on which was a singular assemblage of stars and stripes all this was strange and incomprehensible he recognized on the sign however the ruby face of king george under which he had smoked so many a peaceful pipe but even this was singularly metamorphosed the red coat was changed for one of blue and buff a sword was held in the hand instead of a sceptre the head was decorated with a cocked hat and underneath was painted in large characters general washington there was as usual a crowd of folk about the door but none that rip recollected the very character of the people seemed changed there was a busy bustling disputatious tone about it instead of the accustomed phlegm and drowsy tranquillity he looked in vain for the sage nicholas vetter with his broad face double chin and fair long pipe uttering clouds of tobacco smoke instead of idle speeches or van bummel the schoolmaster doling forth the contents of an ancient newspaper in place of these a lean bilious looking fellow with his pockets full of handbills was haranguing vehemently about rights of citizens elections members of congress liberty bunkers hill heroes of seventy six and other words which were a perfect babylonish jargon to the bewildered van winkle the appearance of rip with his long grizzled beard his rusty fowling piece his uncouth dress and the army of women and children at his heels soon attracted the attention of the tavern politicians they crowded round him eyeing him from head to foot with great curiosity the orator bustled up to him and drawing him partly aside inquired on which side he voted rip stared in vacant stupidity another short but busy little fellow pulled him by the arm and rising on tiptoe inquired in his ear whether he was federal or democrat rip was equally at a loss to comprehend the question when a knowing self-important old gentleman in a sharp cocked hat made his way through the crowd putting them to the right and left with his elbows as he passed and planting himself before van winkle with one arm akimbo the other resting on his cane his keen eyes and sharp hat penetrating as it were into his very soul demanded in an austere tone what brought him to the election with a gun on his shoulder and a mob at his heels and whether he meant to breed a riot in the village alas gentlemen cried rip somewhat dismayed i am a poor quiet man a native of the place and a loyal subject of the king god bless him here a general shout burst from the bystanders a tory a tory a spy a refugee hustle him away with him it was with great difficulty that the self-important man in the cocked hat restored order and having assumed a tenfold austerity of brow demanded again of the unknown culprit what he came there for and whom he was seeking the poor man humbly assured him that he meant no harm but merely came there in search of some of his neighbors who used to keep about the tavern well who are they name them rip bethought himself a moment and inquired where's nicholas vetter there was a silence for a little while when an old man replied in a thin piping voice nicholas vetter why he is dead and gone these eighteen years there was a wooden tombstone in the churchyard they used to tell all about him but that's rotten and gone too where's brom dutcher oh he went off to the army in the beginning of the war some say he was killed at the storming of stony point 
Others say he was drowned in a squall at the foot of Antony's nose. I don't know. He never came back again. Where's Van Bommel, the schoolmaster? He went off to the wars, too, was a great militia general, and is now in Congress. Rip's heart died away at hearing of these sad changes in his home and friends, and finding himself thus alone in the world. Every answer puzzled him, too by treating of such enormous lapses of time, and of matters which he could not understand. War? Congress? Stony Point? He had no courage to ask after any more friends, but cried out in despair, Does nobody here know Rip Van Winkle? Oh, Rip Van Winkle! exclaimed two or three. Oh, to be sure, that's Rip Van Winkle yonder, leaning against the tree. Rip looked and beheld a precise counterpart of himself as he went up the mountain, apparently as lazy and certainly as ragged. The poor fellow was now completely confounded. He doubted his own identity, and whether he was himself or another man. In the midst of his bewilderment, the man in the cocked hat demanded who he was, and what was his name. "'God knows!' exclaimed he, at his wit's end. "'I'm not myself. I'm somebody else. That's me, yonder. No, that's somebody else. Got into my shoes. I was myself last night, but I fell asleep on the mountain. And they've changed my gun, and everything's changed, and I'm changed.' and I can't tell what's my name or who I am. The bystanders began now to look at each other, nod, wink significantly, and tap their fingers against their foreheads. There was a whisper also about securing the gun, and keeping the old fellow from doing mischief, at the very suggestion of which the self-important man with the cocked hat retired with some precipitation. At this critical moment a fresh, comely woman pressed through the throng to get a peep at the grey-bearded man. She had a chubby child in her arms, which, frightened at his looks, began to cry. "'Hush, Rip!' cried she. "'Hush, you little fool! The old man won't hurt you!' The name of the child, the air of the mother, the tone of her voice, all awakened a train of recollections in his mind. "'What is your name, my good woman?' asked he. "'Judith Cardinaire. "'And your father's name?' "'Ah, poor man, Rip Van Winkle was his name. "'But it's twenty years since he went away from home with his gun, "'and never has been heard of since. "'His dog came home without him, "'but whether he shot himself or was carried away by the Indians, "'nobody can tell.' I was then but a little girl. Rip had but one more question to ask, but he put it with a faltering voice. Where's your mother? Oh, she too had died, but a short time since. She broke a blood vessel in a fit of passion at a New England peddler. There was a drop of comfort at least in this intelligence. The honest man could contain himself no longer. He caught his daughter and her child in his arms. "'I am your father,' cried he. "'Young Rip Van Winkle, once old Rip Van Winkle now. Does nobody know poor Rip Van Winkle?' All stood amazed, until an old woman, tottering out from among the crowd, put her hand to her brow, and peering under it in his face for a moment, exclaimed, "'Sure enough!' It is Rip Van Winkle. It is himself. Welcome home again, old neighbor. Why, where have you been these twenty long years? Rip's story was soon told, for the whole twenty years had been to him but as one night. The neighbors stared when they heard it. Some were seen to wink at each other and put their tongues in their cheeks, and the self-important man in the cocked hat, who, when the alarm was over, had returned to the field, screwed down the corners of his mouth, and shook his head, upon which there was a general shaking of the head 
throughout the assemblage. It was determined, however, to take the opinion of old Peter Vanderdonk, who was seen slowly advancing up the road. He was a descendant of the historian of that name, who wrote one of the earliest accounts of the province. Peter was the most ancient inhabitant of the village, and well versed in all the wonderful events and traditions of the neighborhood. He recollected Rip at once, and corroborated his story in the most satisfactory manner. He assured the company that it was a fact, handed down from his ancestor, the historian, that the Catskill Mountains had always been haunted by strange beings, that it was affirmed that the great Hendrick Hudson, the first discoverer of the river and country, kept a kind of vigil there every twenty years, with his crew of the Half Moon, being permitted in this way to revisit the scenes of his enterprise, and keep a guardian eye upon the river, and the great city called by his name, that his father had once seen them in their old Dutch dresses, playing at ninepins in the hollow of the mountain, and that he himself had heard, one summer afternoon, the sound of their balls, like distant peals of thunder. To make a long story short, the company broke up, and returned to the more important concerns of the election. Rip's daughter took him home to live with her. She had a snug, well-furnished house, and a stout, cheery farmer for a husband, whom Rip recollected for one of the urchins that used to climb upon his back. As to Rip's son and heir, who was the ditto of himself, seen leaning against the tree, he was employed to work on the farm, but evinced an hereditary disposition to attend to anything else but his business. Rip now resumed his old walks and habits. He soon found many of his former cronies, though all rather the worse for the wear and tear of time, and preferred making friends among the rising generation, with whom he soon grew into great favor. Having nothing to do at home, and being arrived at that happy age when a man can be idle with impunity, he took his place once more on the bench, at the inn door, and was reverenced as one of the patriarchs of the village, and a chronicle of the old times before the war. It was some time before he could get into the regular track of gossip, or could be made to comprehend the strange events that had taken place during his torpor, how that there had been a revolutionary war, that the country had thrown off the yoke of old England, and that, instead of being a subject to his majesty George the Third, he was now a free citizen of the United States. Rip, in fact, was no politician. The changes of states and empires made but little impression on him, but there was one species of despotism under which he had long groaned, and that was petticoat government. Happily, that was at an end. He had got his neck out of the yoke of matrimony, and could go in and out whenever he pleased, without dreading the tyranny of Dame Van Winkle. Whenever her name was mentioned, however, he shook his head, shrugged his shoulders, and cast up his eyes, which might pass either for an expression of resignation to his fate, or joy at his deliverance. He used to tell his story to every stranger that arrived at Mr. Doolittle's hotel. He was observed at first to vary on some points every time he told it, which was, doubtless, owing to his having so recently awaked. It at last settled down precisely to the tale I have related, and not a man, woman, or child in the neighborhood, but knew it by heart. Some always pretended to doubt the reality of it, and insisted that Rip had been out of his head, and that this was one point on which he always remained flighty. The old Dutch inhabitants, however, almost universally gave it full credit. Even to this day, they never hear a thunderstorm of a summer afternoon about the Catskill, but they say Hendrick Hudson and his crew are at their game of ninepins, and it is a common wish of all henpecked husbands in the neighborhood, when life hangs heavy on their hands, that they might have a quieting draught of Rip Van Winkle's flagon. Note. 
the foregoing tale one would suspect had been suggested to mr knickerbocker by a little german superstition about the emperor frederick der rothbart and the kupphauser mountain the subjoined note however which had appended to the tale shows that it is an absolute fact narrated with his usual fidelity the story of rip van winkle may seem incredible to many but nevertheless i give it my full belief for i know the vicinity of our old dutch settlements to have been very subject to marvellous events and appearances indeed i have heard many stranger stories than this in the villages along the hudson all of which were too well authenticated to admit of a doubt i have even talked with rip van winkle myself who when last i saw him was a very venerable old man and so perfectly rational and consistent on every other point that i think no conscientious person could refuse to take this into the bargain nay i have seen a certificate on the subject taken before a country justice and signed with cross in the justice's own handwriting the story therefore is beyond the possibility of doubt d k postscript the following are travelling notes from a memorandum book of mr knickerbocker the catsburg or catskill mountains have always been a region full of fable the indians considered them the abode of spirits who influenced the weather spreading sunshine or clouds over the landscape and sending good or bad hunting seasons they were ruled by an old squaw spirit said to be their mother she dwelt on the highest peak of the catskills and had charge of the doors of day and night to open and shut them at the proper hour she hung up the new moons in the skies and cut up the old ones into stars in times of drought if properly propitiated she would spin light summer clouds out of cobwebs and morning dew and send them off from the crest of the mountain flake after flake like flakes of carded cotton to float in the air until dissolved by the heat of the sun they would fall in gentle showers causing the grass to spring the fruits to ripen and the corn to grow an inch an hour if displeased however she would brew up clouds black as ink sitting in the midst of them like a bottle-bellied spider in the midst of its web and when these clouds broke woe betide the valleys in old times say the indian traditions there was a kind of manitou or spirit who kept about the wildest recesses of the catskill mountains and took a mischievous pleasure in wreaking all kinds of evils and vexations upon the red men sometimes he would assume the form of a bear a panther or a deer lead the bewildered hunter a weary chase through tangled forests and among ragged rocks and then spring off with a loud ho ho leaving him aghast on the brink of a beetling precipice or raging torrent the favorite abode of this manitou is still shown it is a rock or cliff on the loneliest port of the mountains and from the flowering vines which clamber about it and the wild flowers which abound in its neighborhood is known by the name of the garden rock near the foot of it is a small lake the haunt of the solitary bittern with wild snakes basking in the sun on the leaves of the pond lilies which lie on the surface this place was held in great awe by the indians insomuch that the boldest hunter would not pursue his game within its precincts once upon a time however a hunter who had lost his way penetrated to the garden rock where he beheld a number of gourds placed in the crotches of trees one of these he seized and made off with it but in the hurry of his retreat he let it fall among the rocks when a great stream gushed forth which washed him away and swept him down precipices where he was dished to pieces and the stream made its way to the hudson and continues to flow to the present day being the identical stream known by the name of the catterskill end of section 2 recording by greg giordano 
Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 3 of Selected Classics of Washington Irving by Washington Irving. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano. Section 3 Rural Life in England. Oh, friendly to the best pursuits of man, friendly to thought, to virtue, and to peace, domestic life and rural pleasures past. Cowper. The stranger who would form a correct opinion of the English character must not confine his observations to the metropolis. He must go forth into the country. He must sojourn in villages and hamlets. He must visit castles, villas, farmhouses, cottages. He must wander through parks and gardens, along hedges and green lanes. He must loiter about country churches, attend wakes and fairs, and other rural festivals, and cope with the people in all their conditions, and all their habits and humors. In some countries the large cities absorb the wealth and fashion of the nation. They are the only fixed abodes of elegant and intelligent society, and the country is inhabited almost entirely by boorish peasantry. In England, on the contrary, the metropolis is a mere gathering place, or general rendezvous, of the polite classes, where they devote a small portion of the year to a hurry of gaiety and dissipation, and, having indulged this kind of carnival, return again to the apparently more congenial habits of rural life. The various orders of society are therefore diffused over the whole surface of the kingdom, and the more retired neighborhoods afford specimens of the different ranks. The English, in fact, are strongly gifted with the rural feeling. They possess a quick sensibility to the beauties of nature, and a keen relish for the pleasures and employments of the country. This passion seems inherent in them, even the inhabitants of cities, born and brought up among brick walls and bustling streets, enter with facility into rural habits, and evince a tact for rural occupation. The merchant has his snug retreat in the vicinity of the metropolis, where he often displays as much pride and zeal in the cultivation of his flower garden and the maturing of his fruits as he does in the conduct of his business, and the success of a commercial enterprise. Even those less fortunate individuals, who are doomed to pass their lives in the midst of din and traffic, contrive to have something that shall remind them of the green aspects of nature. In the most dark and dingy quarters of the city, the drawing-room window resembles frequently a bank of flowers every spot capable of vegetation has its grass plot and flower bed and every square its mimic park laid out with picturesque taste and gleaming with refreshing verdure those who see the englishman only in town are apt to form an unfavorable opinion of his social character he is either absorbed in business or distracted by the thousand engagements that dissipate time, thought, and feeling in this huge metropolis. He has, therefore, too commonly, a look of hurry and abstraction. Wherever he happens to be, he is on the point of going somewhere else. At the moment he is talking on one subject, his mind is wandering to another, and while paying a friendly visit, he is calculating how he shall economize time so as to pay the other visits allotted to the morning. An immense metropolis, like London, 
is calculated to make men selfish and uninteresting. In their casual and transient meetings, they can but deal briefly in commonplaces. They present but the cold superfices of character. Its rich and genial qualities have no time to be warmed into a flow. It is in the country that the Englishman gives scope to his natural feelings. He breaks loose gladly from the cold formalities and negative civilities of town, throws off his habits of shy reserve, and becomes joyous and free-hearted. He manages to collect round him all the conveniences and elegancies of polite life, and to banish its restraints. His country seat abounds with every requisite, either for studious retirement, tasteful gratification, or rural exercise. Books, paintings, music, horses, dogs, and sporting implements of all kinds are at hand. He puts no constraint either upon his guests or himself, but, in the true spirit of hospitality, provides the means of enjoyment, and leaves every one to partake according to his inclination. The taste of the English in the cultivation of land, and in what is called landscape gardening, is unrivaled. They have studied nature intently, and discovered an exquisite sense of her beautiful forms and harmonious combinations. Those charms which, in other countries, she lavishes in wild solitudes, are here assembled round the haunts of domestic life. They seem to have caught her coy and furtive graces, and spread them, like witchery, about their rural abodes. Nothing can be more imposing than the magnificence of English park scenery. Vast lawns that extend like sheets of vivid green, with here and there clumps of gigantic trees, heaping up rich piles of foliage, the solemn pomp of groves and woodland glades, and the deer trooping in silent herds across them, the hare bounding away to the covert, or the pheasant suddenly bursting upon the wing. The brook, taught to wind in natural meanderings, or expand into a glassy lake, the sequestered pool, reflecting the quivering trees, with the yellow leaf sleeping on its bosom, and the trout roaming fearlessly about its limpid waters, while some rustic temple or sylvan statue, grown green and dank with age, gives an air of classic sanctity to the seclusion. These are but a few of the features of park scenery, but what most delights me is the creative talent with which the English decorate the unostentatious abodes of middle life. The rudest habitation, the most unpromising and scanty portion of land, in the hands of an Englishman of taste, becomes a little paradise. With a nicely discriminating eye, he seizes at once upon its capabilities, and pictures in his mind the future landscape. The sterile spot grows into loveliness under his hand, and yet the operations of art which produce the effect are scarcely to be perceived. The cherishing and training of some trees, the cautious pruning of others, the nice distribution of flowers and plants of tender and graceful foliage, the introduction of a green slope of velvet turf, the partial opening to a peep of blue distance, or silver gleam of water, all these are managed with a delicate tact, a pervading yet quiet assiduity, like the magic touchings with which a painter finishes up a favorite picture. The residence of people of fortune and refinement in the country has diffused a degree of taste and elegance in rural economy that descends to the lowest class. The very laborer, with his thatched cottage and narrow slip of ground, attends to their embellishment. The trim hedge, the grass plot before the door, the little flower-bed bordered with snug box, the woodbine trained up against the wall, and hanging its blossoms about the lattice, the pot of flowers in the window, the holly, 
providently planted about the house, to cheat winter of its dreariness, and to throw in a semblance of green summer to cheer the fireside. All these beseek the influence of taste, flowing down from high sources, and pervading the lowest levels of the public mind. If ever love, as poets sing, delights to visit a cottage, it must be the cottage of an English peasant. The fondness for rural life among the higher classes of the English has had a great and salutary effect upon the national character. I do not know a finer race of men than the English gentlemen, instead of the softness and effeminacy which characterize the men of rank in most countries. They exhibit a union of elegance and strength, a robustness of frame and freshness of complexion, which I am inclined to attribute to their living so much in the open air, and pursuing so eagerly the invigorating recreations of the country. The hardy exercises produce also a healthful tone of mind and spirits, and a manliness and simplicity of manners, which even the follies and dissipations of the town cannot easily pervert, and can never entirely destroy. In the country, too, the different orders of society seem to approach more freely, to be more disposed to blend and operate favorably upon each other. The distinctions between them do not appear to be so marked and impassable as in the cities. The manner in which property has been distributed into small estates and farms has established a regular gradation from the noblemen to the class of gentry, small landed proprietors, and substantial farmers, down to the laboring peasantry. And while it has thus banded the extremes of society together, has infused into each intermediate rank a spirit of independence. This, it must be confessed, is not so universally the case at present as it was formerly, the larger estates having, in late years of distress, absorbed the smaller, and in some parts of the country almost annihilated the sturdy race of small farmers. These, however, I believe, are but casual breaks in the general system I have mentioned. In rural occupation there is nothing mean and debasing. It leads a man forth among scenes of natural grandeur and beauty. It leaves him to the workings of his own mind, operated upon by the purest and most elevating of external influences. Such a man may be simple and rough, but he cannot be vulgar. The man of refinement, therefore, finds nothing revolting in an intercourse with the lower orders in rural life, as he does when he casually mingles with the lower orders of cities. He lays aside his distance and reserve, and is glad to waive the distinctions of rank, and to enter into the honest, heartfelt enjoyments of common life. Indeed, the very amusements of the country ring men more and more together, and the sound hound and horn blend all feelings into harmony. I believe this is one great reason why the nobility and gentry are more popular among the inferior orders in England than they are in any other country, and why the latter have endured so many excessive pressures and extremities, without repining more generally at the unequal distribution of fortune and privilege. To this mingling of cultivated and rustic society may also be attributed the rural feeling that runs through British literature, the frequent use of illustrations from rural life, those incomparable descriptions of nature that abound in the British poets, that have continued down from the flower and the leaf of Chaucer, and have brought into our closets all the freshness and fragrance of the dewy landscape. The pastoral writers of other countries appear as if they had paid nature an occasional visit, and become acquainted with her general charms. But the British poets have lived and reveled with her. They have wooed her in her most secret haunts. They have watched her minutest caprices. A spray could not tremble in the breeze. A leaf could not rustle to the ground. 
a diamond drop could not patter in the stream a fragrance could not exhale from the humble violet nor a daisy unfold its crimson tints to the morning but it has been noticed by these impassioned and delicate observers and wrought up into some beautiful morality the effect of this devotion of elegant minds to rural occupations has been wonderful on the face of the country a great part of the island is rather level and would be monotonous were it not for the charms of culture but it is studded and gemmed as it were with castles and palaces and embroidered with parks and gardens it does not abound in grand and sublime prospects but rather in little home scenes of rural repose and sheltered quiet every antique farmhouse and moss-grown cottage is a picture and as the roads are continually winding and the view is shut in by groves and hedges the eye is delighted by a continual succession of small landscapes of captivating loveliness the great charm however of english scenery is the moral feeling that seems to pervade it it is associated in the mind with ideas of order of quiet of sober well-established principles of hoary usage and reverend custom everything seems to be the growth of ages of regular and peaceful existence the old church of remote architecture with its low massive portal its gothic tower its windows rich with tracery and painted glass and scrupulous preservation its stately monuments of warriors and worthies of the olden time ancestors of the present lords of the soil its tombstones recording successive generations of sturdy yeomanry whose progeny still ploughed the same fields and kneel at the same altar the parsonage a quaint irregular pile partly antiquated but repaired and altered in the tastes of various ages and occupants the style and footpath leading from the churchyard across pleasant fields and along shady hedgerows according to an immemorial right of way the neighboring village with its venerable cottages its public green sheltered by trees under which the forefathers of the present race have sported the antique family mansion standing apart in some little rural domain but looking down with a protecting air on the surrounding scene all these common features of english landscape evince a calm and settled security a hereditary transmission of home-bred virtues and local attachments that speak deeply and touchingly for the moral character of the nation it is a pleasing sight of a sunday morning when the bell is sending its sober melody across the quiet fields to behold the peasantry in their best finery with ruddy faces and modest cheerfulness thronging tranquilly along the green lanes to church but it is still more pleasing to see them in the evenings gathering about their cottage doors and appearing to exult in the humble comforts and embellishments which their own hands have spread around them it is this sweet home feeling this settled repose of affection in the domestic scene that is after all the parent of the steadiest virtues and purest enjoyments and i cannot close these desultory remarks better than by quoting the words of a modern english poet who has depicted it with remarkable felicity through each gradation from the castled hall the city dome the villa crowned with shade but chief from modest mansions numberless in town or hamlet sheltering middle life down to the cottage vale and straw-roofed shed this western isle has long been famed for scenes where bliss domestic finds a dwelling place domestic bliss that like a harmless dove honor and sweet endearment keeping guard can center in a little quiet nest all that desire would fly forth through the earth that can the world eluding 
be itself. A world enjoyed that wants no witnesses, but its own sharers in approving heaven. That, like a flower deep hid in rock cleft, smiles, though it is looked only at the sky. From a poem on the death of the Princess Charlotte, by the Reverend Ran Kennedy, A.M. End of Section 3 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section 4 of Selected Classics of Washington Irving by Washington Irving This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano Section 4 The Boar's Head Tavern East Cheap A Shakespearean Research A tavern is the rendezvous, the exchange, the staple of good fellows. I have heard my great-grandfather tell how his great-great-grandfather should say that it was an old proverb when his great-grandfather was a child that it was a good wind that blew a man to the wine mother bombi it is a pious custom in some catholic countries to honor the memory of saints by votive lights burnt before their pictures the popularity of a saint therefore may be known by the number of these offerings one perhaps is left to moulder in the darkness of his little chapel another may have a solitary lamp to throw its blinking rays athwart his effigy while the whole blaze of adoration is lavished at the shrine of some beatified father of renown the wealthy devotee brings his huge luminary of wax the eager zealot his seven-branched candlestick and even the mendicant pilgrim is by no means satisfied that sufficient light is thrown upon the deceased unless he hangs up his little lamp of smoking oil the consequence is that in the eagerness to enlighten they are often apt to obscure and i have occasionally seen an unlucky saint almost smoked out of countenance by the officiousness of his followers in like manner has it fared with the immortal shakespeare every writer considers it his bounden duty to light up some portion of his character or works and to rescue some merit from oblivion the commentator opulent in words produces vast tomes of dissertations the common herd of editors send up mists of obscurity from their notes at the bottom of each page and every casual scribbler brings his farthing rushlight of eulogy or research to swell the cloud of incense and of smoke as i honor all established usages of my brethren of the quill i thought it but proper to contribute my mite of homage to the memory of the illustrious bard i was for some time however sorely puzzled in what way i should discharge this duty i found myself anticipated in every attempt at a new reading every doubtful line had been explained a dozen different ways and perplexed beyond the reach of elucidation and as to fine passages they had all been amply praised by previous admirers nay so completely had the bard of late been overlarded with panegyric by a great german critic that it was difficult now to find even a fault that had not been argued into a beauty in this perplexity i was one morning turning over his pages when i casually opened upon the comic scenes of henry the fourth and was in a moment completely lost in the madcap revelry of the boar's head tavern so vividly and naturally are these scenes of humour depicted and with such force and consistency are the characters sustained that they become mingled up in the mind with the facts and personages of real life to few readers does it occur 
that these are all ideal creations of a poet's brain, and that, in sober truth, no such knot of merry roisterers ever enlivened the dull neighborhood of Eastcheap. For my part, I love to give myself up to the illusions of poetry. A hero of fiction that never existed is just as valuable to me as a hero of history that existed a thousand years since, and, if I may be excused, such an insensibility to the common ties of human nature, I would not give up Fat Jack for half the great men of ancient chronicle. What have the heroes of yore done for mere men like me? They have conquered countries of which I do not enjoy an acre, or they have gained laurels of which I do not inherit a leaf, or they have furnished examples of hare-brained prowess which I have neither the opportunity nor the inclination to follow. But, old Jack Falstaff, kind Jack Falstaff, sweet Jack Falstaff, has enlarged the boundaries of human enjoyment. He has added vast regions of wit and good humor, in which the poorest man may revel, and has bequeathed a never-failing inheritance of jolly laughter to make mankind merrier and better to the latest posterity. A thought suddenly struck me. I will make a pilgrimage to Eastcheap, said I, closing the book, and see if the old Boar's Head Tavern still exists. Who knows, but I may light upon some legendary traces of Dame Quickly and her guests. At any rate, there will be a kindred pleasure in treading the halls once vocal with their mirth, to that the toper enjoys in smelling to the empty cask, once filled with generous wine. The resolution was no sooner formed than put in execution. I forbear to treat of the various adventures and wanders I encountered in my travels, of the haunted regions of Cock Lane, of the faded glories of Little Britain, and the parts adjacent, what perils I ran in Catterton Street and Old Jewry, of the renowned Guildhall, and its two stunted giants, the pride and wonder of the city, and the terror of all unlikely urchins, and how I visited London Stone, and struck my staff upon it, in imitation of that arch-rebel, Jack Cade. Let it suffice to say, that I at length arrived in Mary Eastcheap, that ancient region of wit and wassail, where the very names of the streets relished of good cheer. As Pudding Lane bears testimony, even at the present day. For Eastcheap, says old Stowe, was always famous for its convivial doings. The cooks cried hot ribs of beef roasted, pies well baked, and other victuals. There was clattering of pewter pots, harp, pipe, and sautry. Alas! How sadly is the scene changed since the roaring days of Falstaff and Old Stowe. The madcap roisterer has given place to the plodding tradesman, the clattering of pots and the sound of harp and sautry to the din of carts and the accursed dinging of the dustman's bell. And no song is heard, save, haply, the strain of some siren from Billingsgate, chanting the eulogy of deceased mackerel. I sought in vain for the ancient abode of Dame Quickly. The only relic of it is a boar's head, carved in relief in stone, which formerly served as the sign, but at present is built into the parting line of two houses, which stand on the site of the renowned old tavern. For the history of this little abode of good fellowship, I was referred to a tallow chandler's widow opposite who had been born and brought up on the spot and was looked up to as the indisputable chronicler of the neighborhood i found her seated in a little back parlor the window of which looked out upon a yard about eight feet square laid out as a flower garden while a glass door opposite afforded a distant view of the street through a vista of soap and tallow candles the two views which comprised, in all probability, her prospects in life and the little world in which she had lived and moved 
and had had her being for the latter part of a century. To be versed in the history of Eastcheap, great and little, from London stone, even unto the monument, was doubtless, in her opinion, to be acquainted with the history of the universe. Yet with all this, she possessed the simplicity of true wisdom, and that liberal, communicative disposition, which I have generally remarked in intelligent old ladies, knowing in the concerns of their neighborhood. Her information, however, did not extend far back into antiquity. She could throw no light upon the history of the boar's head, from the time that Dame Quickly espoused the valiant pistol until the great fire of London, when it was unfortunately burnt down. It was soon rebuilt, and continued to flourish under the old name and sign, until a dying landlord, struck with remorse for double scores, bad measures, and other iniquities which are incident to the sinful race of publicans, endeavored to make his peace with heaven by bequeathing the tavern to St. Michael's Church, Crooked Lane, toward the supporting of a chaplain. For some time the vestry meetings were regularly held there, but it was observed that the old boar never held up his head under church government. He gradually declined, and finally gave his last gasp about thirty years since. The tavern was then turned into shops, but she informed me that a picture of it was still preserved in St. Michael's Church, which stood just in the rear. To get a sight of this picture was now my determination. So, having informed myself of the abode of the sexton, I took my leave of that venerable chronicler of Eastcheap, my visit having doubtless raised greatly her opinion of her legendary lore, and furnished an important incident in the history of her life. It cost me some difficulty and much curious inquiry to ferret out the humble hanger-on to the church. I had to explore Crooked Lane, and diverse little alleys and elbows and dark passages with which this old city is perforated like an ancient cheese, or a worm-eaten chest of drawers. At length I traced him to a corner of a small court, surrounded by lofty houses, where the inhabitants enjoy about as much of the face of heaven as a community of frogs at the bottom of a well. The sexton was a meek, acquiescing little man, of a bowing, lowly habit, yet he had a pleasant twinkling in his eye, and if encouraged, would now and then hazard a small pleasantry, such as a man of his low estate might venture to make in the company of high church wardens and other mighty men of the earth. I found him in company with the deputy organist, seated apart like Milton's angels, discoursing, no doubt, on high doctrinal points, and settling the affairs of the church over a friendly pot of ale, for the lower classes of English seldom deliberate on any weighty matter without the assistance of a cool tankard to clear their understandings. I arrived at the moment when they had finished their ale and their argument, and were about to repair to the church to put it in order. So, having made known my wishes, I received their gracious permission to accompany them. The church of St. Michael's, Crooked Lane, standing a short distance from Billingsgate, is enriched with the tombs of many fishmongers of renown and as every profession has its galaxy of glory and its constellation of great men, I presume the monument of a mighty fishmonger of the olden time is regarded with as much reverence by succeeding generations of the craft as poets feel on contemplating the tomb of Virgil or soldiers the monument of Marlborough or Turin. I cannot but turn aside, while thus speaking of illustrious men, to observe that St. Michael's, Crooked Lane, contains also the ashes of that doughty champion, William Walworth, knight who so manfully clove down the sturdy wit, Watt Tyler, and Smithfield, a hero worthy of honorable blazon, as almost the only Lord Mayor on record, famous for deeds of arms, the sovereigns of Cockney, being generally renowned as the most pacific of all potentates. The following was the ancient inscription on the monument of this worthy, 
which unhappily was destroyed in the great conflagration here under lieth a man of fame william walworth called by name fishmonger he was in lifetime here and twas lord mayor as in books appear who with courage stout and manly might slew jack straw in king richard's sight for which act done and true intent the king made him knight incontinent and gave him arms as here you see to declare his fact and chivalry he left this life the year of our god thirteen hundred fourscore and three odd an error in the foregoing inscription has been corrected by the venerable stowe whereas saith he it hath been far spread abroad by vulgar opinion that the rebel smitten down so manfully by sir william walworth the then worthy lord mayor was named jack straw and not wat tyler i thought good to reconcile this rash conceived doubt by such testimony as i find in ancient and good records the principal leaders or captains of the commons were wat tyler as the first man the second was john or jack straw etc etc stowe's london adjoining the church in a small cemetery immediately under the back window of what was once the boar's head stands the tombstone of robert preston wilhelm drawer as the tavern it is now nearly a century since this trusty drawer of good liquor closed his bustling career and was thus quietly deposited within call of his customers as i was clearing away the weeds from his epitaph the little sexton drew me on one side with a mysterious air and informed me in a low voice that once upon a time on a dark wintry night when the wind was unruly howling and whistling banging about doors and windows and twirling weather cocks so that the living were frightened out of their beds and even the dead could not sleep quietly in their graves the ghost of honest preston which happened to be airing itself in the churchyard was attracted by the well-known call of waiter from the boar's head and made its sudden appearance in the midst of a roaring club just as the parish clerk was singing a stave from the merry garland of captain death to the discomfiture of sundry train-band captains and the conversion of an infidel attorney who became a zealous christian on the spot and was never known to twist the truth afterwards except in the way of business i beg it may be remembered that i do not pledge myself for the authenticity of this anecdote though it is well known that the churchyards and by corners of this old metropolis are very much infested with perturbed spirits and every one must have heard of the cock lane ghost and the apparition that guards the regalia in the tower which has frightened so many bold sentinels almost out of their wits be all this as it may this robert preston seems to have been a worthy successor to the nimble-tongued francis who attended upon the revels of prince hal to have been equally prompt with his anon anon sir and to have transcended his predecessor in honesty for falstaff the veracity of whose taste no man will venture to impeach flatly accuses francis of putting lime in his sack whereas honest preston's epitaph lands him for the sobriety of his conduct the soundness of his wine and the fairness of his measure the worthy dignitaries of the church however did not appear much captivated by the sober virtues of the tapster the deputy organist who had a moist look out of the eye made some shrewd remark on the abstemiousness of a man brought up among full hogsheads and the little sexton corroborated his opinion by a significant wink and a dubious shake of the head as this inscription is rife with excellent morality i transcribe it for the admonition of delinquent tapsters it is no doubt the production of some choice spirit who once frequented the boar's head bacchus to give the topping world a surprise 
produced one sober son, and here he lies. Though reared among full hogs' heads, he defied the charms of wine, and every one beside. O reader, if to justice thou art inclined, keep honest Preston daily in thy mind. He drew good wine, took care to fill his pots, had sundry virtues that excused his faults. You then on Bacchus have the like dependence. Pray copy Bob in measure and attendance. Thus far my researches, though they threw much light on the history of tapsters, fishmongers, and lord mayors, yet disappointed me in the great object of my quest, the picture of the Boar's Head Tavern. No such painting was to be found in the church of St. Michael's. Mary and Amen, said I, here endeth my research. So as giving the matter up, when the air of a baffled antiquary, when my friend the sexton, perceiving me to be curious in everything relative to the old tavern, offered to show me the choice vessels of the vestry, which had been handed down from remote times, when the parish meetings were held at the boar's head. These were deposited in the parish club-room, which had been transferred, on the decline of the ancient establishment, to a tavern in the neighborhood. A few steps brought us to the house, which stands number twelve miles lane, bearing the title of the Mason's Arms, and is kept by Master Edward Honeyball, the bully rock of the establishment. It is one of those little taverns which abound in the heart of the city, and form the centre of gossip and intelligence of the neighbourhood. We entered the bar-room, which was narrow and darkling, for in those close lanes but few rays of reflected light are enabled to struggle down to the inhabitants whose broad day is at best but a tolerable twilight. The room was partitioned into boxes, each containing a table spread with a clean white cloth ready for dinner. This showed that the guests were of the good old stamp, and divided their day equally, for it was but just one o'clock. At the lower end of the room was a clear coal fire, before which a breast of lamb was roasting, a row of bright brass candlesticks and pewter mugs glistened along the mantelpiece, and an old-fashioned clock ticked in one corner. There was something primitive in this medley of kitchen, parlor, and hall that carried me back to earlier times and pleased me. The place, indeed, was humble, but everything had the look of order and neatness which bespeaks the superintendence of a notable English housewife. A group of amphibious-looking beings, who might be either fishermen or sailors, were regaling themselves in one of the boxes. As I was a visitor of rather higher pretensions, I was ushered into a little misshapen back room, having at least nine corners. It was lighted by a skylight, furnished with antiquated leathern chairs, and ornamented with the portrait of a fat pig was evidently appropriated to particular customers, and I found a shabby gentleman in a red nose and oilcloth hat seated in one corner meditating on a half-empty pot of porter. The old sexton had taken the landlady aside, and with an air of profound importance imparted to her my errand. Dame Honeyball was a likely, plump, bustling little woman, and no bad substitute for that paragon of hostesses Dame quickly. She seemed delighted with an opportunity to oblige, and, hurrying upstairs to the archives of her house, where the precious vessels of the parish club were deposited, she returned, smiling and courtesying, with them in her hands. The first she presented me was a japanned iron tobacco box of gigantic size, out of which I was told the vestry had smoked at their stated meetings since time immemorial, and which was never suffered to be profaned by vulgar hands, or used on common occasions. I received it with becoming reverence, but what was my delight at beholding on its cover the identical painting of which I was in quest. There was displayed the outside of the Boar's Head Tavern, and before the door was to be seen the whole convivial group at table, in full revel, pictured with that wonderful fidelity and force 
with which the portraits of renowned generals and commodores are illustrated on tobacco boxes for the benefit of posterity lest however there should be any mistake the cunning liner had warily inscribed the names of prince hal and falstaff on the bottoms of their chairs on the inside of the cover was an inscription nearly obliterated recording that this box was the gift of sir richard gore for the use of the vestry meetings at the boar's head tavern and that it was repaired and beautified by his successor mr john packard seventeen sixty seven such is a faithful description of this august and venerable relic and i question whether the learned scriblerius contemplated his roman shield or the knights of the round table the long-sought san greal with more exultation while i was meditating on it with enraptured gaze dame honeyball who was highly gratified by the interest it excited put in my hands a drinking cup or goblet which also belonged to the vestry and was descended from the old boar's head it bore the inscription of having been the gift of francis withers knight and was held she told me in exceeding great value being considered very antique this last opinion was strengthened by the shabby gentleman with the red nose and oilcloth hat and whom i strongly suspected of being a lineal descendant from the variant Berdolf. he suddenly aroused from his meditation on the pot of porter and casting a knowing look at the goblet exclaimed ay ay the head don't ache now that made that there article the great importance attached to this memento of ancient revelry by modern church wardens at first puzzled me but there is nothing sharpens the apprehension so much as antiquarian research for i immediately perceived that this could be no other than the identical parcel gilt goblet in which falstaff made his loving but faithless vow to dame quickly and which would of course be treasured up with care among the regalia of her domains as a testimony of that solemn contract thou didst swear to me upon a parcel gilt goblet sitting in my dolphin chamber at the round table by a sea-coal fire on wednesday in whitson week when the prince broke thy head for likening his father to a singing man at windsor thou didst swear to me then as i was washing thy wound to marry me and make me my lady thy wife canst thou deny it henry the fourth part two mine hostess indeed gave me a long history how the goblet had been handed down from generation to generation she also entertained me with many particulars concerning the worthy vestrymen who have seated themselves thus quietly on the stools of the ancient roisterers of Eastcheap, and, like so many commentators, utter clouds of smoke in honor of Shakespeare. These I forbear to relate, lest my readers should not be as curious in these matters as myself. Suffice it to say, the neighbors, one and all, about Eastcheap, believe that Falstaff and his merry crew actually lived and reveled there nay there are several legendary anecdotes concerning him still extant among the oldest frequenters of the mason's arms which they give as transmitted down from their forefathers and mr mccash an irish hairdresser whose shop stands on the site of the old boar's head has several dry jokes of fat jacks not laid down in the books with which he makes his customers ready to die of laughter I now turned to my friend the sexton to make some further inquiries, but I found him sunk in pensive meditation. His head had declined a little on one side. A deep sigh heaved from the very bottom of his stomach, and, though I could not see a tear trembling in his eye, yet a moisture was evidently stealing from a corner of his mouth. I followed the direction of his eye through the door which stood open and found it fixed wistfully on the savory breast of lamb roasting in dripping richness before the fire i now called to mind that in the eagerness of my recondite investigation i was keeping the poor man from his dinner 
my bowels yearned with sympathy and putting in his hand a small token of my gratitude and goodness i departed with a hearty benediction on him dame honeyball in the parish club of crooked lane not forgetting my shabby but sententious friend in the oilcloth hat and copper nose thus have i given a tedious brief account of this interesting research for which if it prove too short and unsatisfactory i can only plead my inexperience in this branch of literature so deservedly popular at the present day i am aware that a more skilful illustrator of the immortal bard would have swelled the materials i have touched upon to a good merchantable bulk comprising the biographies of william walworth jack straw and robert preston some notice of the eminent fishmongers of st michael's the history of Eastcheap, great and little, private anecdotes of Dame Honeyball and her pretty daughter, whom I have not even mentioned, to say nothing of a damsel tending the breast of lamb, and whom, by the way, I remarked to be a comely lass with a neat foot and ankle, the whole enlivened by the riots of Wat Tyler and illuminated by the great fire of London. All this I leave as a rich mine, to be worked by future commentators nor do i despair of seeing the tobacco-box and the parcel-gilt goblet which i have thus brought to light the subject of future engravings and almost as fruitful of voluminous dissertations and disputes as the shield of achilles or the far-flamed portland vase end of section four recording by greg giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida. And five of Selected Classics of Washington Irving by Washington Irving. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano. Section 5. The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Part 1. The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Found among the papers of the late Diedrich Knickerbocker. A pleasing land of drowsy head it was, of dreams that wave before the half-shut eye and of gay castles in the clouds that pays, for ever flushing round a summer sky. Castle of Indolence In the bosom of one of those spacious coves which indent the eastern shore of the Hudson, at that broad expansion of the river, denominated by the ancient Dutch navigators, the Tappan Zee, and where they always prudently shortened sail and implored the protection of st nicholas when they crossed there lies a small market town or rural port which by some is called greensburg but which is more generally and properly known by the name of tarry town this name was given we are told in former days by the good housewives of the adjacent country from the inveterate propensity of their husbands to linger about the village tavern on market days be that as it may i do not vouch for the fact but merely advert to it for the sake of being precise and authentic not far from this village perhaps about two miles there is a little valley or rather lap of land among high hills which is one of the quietest places in the whole world a small brook glides through it with just murmur enough to lull one to repose and the occasional whistle of a quail or tapping of a woodpecker is almost the only sound that ever breaks in upon the uniform tranquillity I recollect that when a stripling, my first exploit in squirrel shooting was in a grove of tall walnut trees, 
that shades one side of the valley. I had wandered into it at noontime, when all nature is peculiarly quiet, and was startled by the roar of my own gun as it broke the Sabbath stillness around, and was prolonged and reverberated by the angry echoes. If ever I should wish for a retreat, whither I might steal from the world and its distractions, and dream quietly away the remnant of a troubled life, I know of none more promising than this little valley. From the listless repose of the place, and the peculiar character of its inhabitants, who are descendants from the original Dutch settlers, this sequestered glen has long been known by the name of Sleepy Hollow, and its rustic lads are called the Sleepy Hollow Boys throughout all the neighboring country. A drowsy, dreamy influence seems to hang over the land, and to pervade the very atmosphere. Some say that the place was bewitched by a high German doctor during the early days of the settlement. Others, that an old Indian chief, the prophet or wizard of his tribe, held his powwows there before the country was discovered by Master Hendrick Hudson. Certain it is, the place still continues under the sway of some witching power that holds a spell over the minds of the good people, causing them to walk in a continual reverie. They are given to all kinds of marvelous beliefs, and are subject to trances and visions, and frequently see strange sights, and hear music and voices in the air. The whole neighborhood abounds with local tales, haunted spots, and twilight superstitions. Stars shoot and meteors glare oftener across the valley than in any other part of the country, and the nightmare, with her whole ninefold, seems to make it the favorite scene of her gambols. The dominant spirit, however, that haunts this enchanted region, and seems to be commander-in-chief of all the powers of the air, is the apparition of a figure on horseback without a head. It is said by some to be the ghost of a Hessian trooper, whose head had been carried away by a cannonball in some nameless battle during the Revolutionary War, and who is ever and anon seen by the country folk hurrying along in the gloom of night, as if on the wings of the wind. His haunts are not confined to the valley, but extend at times to the adjacent roads, and especially to the vicinity of a church at no great distance. Indeed, certain of the most authentic historians of those parts, who have been careful in collecting and collating the floating facts concerning this spectre, allege that the body of the trooper, having been buried in the churchyard, the ghost rides forth to the scene of battle in nightly quest of his head and that the rushing speed with which he sometimes passes along the hollow, like a midnight blast, is owing to his being belated, and in a hurry to get back to the churchyard before daybreak. Such is the general purport of this legendary superstition, which has furnished materials for many a wild story in that region of shadows, and the spectre is known at all the country firesides, by the name of the Headless Horseman of Sleepy Hollow. It is remarkable that the visionary propensity I have mentioned is not confined to the native inhabitants of the valley, but is unconsciously imbibed by every one who resides there for a time, however wide awake they may have been before they entered that sleepy region. They are sure in a little time to inhale the witching influence of the air, and begin to grow imaginative, to dream dreams, and see apparitions. I mention this peaceful spot with all possible laud, for it is in such little retired Dutch valleys, found here and there embosomed in the great state of New York, that population, manners, and customs 
remain fixed, while the great torrent of migration and improvement, which is making such incessant changes in other parts of this restless country, sweeps by them unobserved. They are like those little nooks of still water, which border a rapid stream, where we may see the straw and bubble riding quietly at anchor, or slowly revolving in their mimic harbor, undisturbed by the rush of the passing current. Though many years have elapsed since I trod the drowsy shades of Sleepy Hollow, yet I question whether I should not still find the same trees and the same families vegetating in its sheltered bosom. In this by-place of nature there abode, in a remote period of American history, that is to say, some thirty years since, a worthy white of the name of Ichabod Crane, who sojourned, or, as he expressed it, tarried in Sleepy Hollow, for the purpose of instructing the children of the vicinity. He was a native of Connecticut, a state which supplies the Union with pioneers for the mind as well as for the forest, and sends forth yearly its legions of frontier woodmen and country schoolmasters. The cognomen of Crane was not inapplicable to his person. He was tall, but exceedingly lank, with narrow shoulders, long arms and legs, hands that dangled a mile out of his sleeves, feet that might have served for shovels, and his whole frame most loosely hung together. His head was small and flat at top, with huge ears, large green glassy eyes, and a long snip nose, so that it looked like a weather cock perched upon his spindle neck to tell which way the wind blew. To see him striding along the profile of a hill on a windy day, with his clothes bagging and fluttering about him, one might have mistaken him for the genius of famine descending upon the earth, or some scarecrow eloped from a cornfield. His schoolhouse was a low building of one large room, rudely constructed of logs. The windows partly glazed and partly patched with leaves of old copy books. It was most ingeniously secured at vacant hours by a width twisted in the handle of the door and stakes set against the window shutters, so that, though a thief might get in with perfect ease, he would find some embarrassment in getting out, an idea most probably borrowed by the architect, Jost van Houten, from the mystery of an eel-pot. The schoolhouse stood in a rather lonely but pleasant situation, just at the foot of a woody hill with a brook running close by, and a formidable birch-tree growing at one end of it. From hence the low murmur of his pupils' voices, conning over their lessons, might be heard in a drowsy summer's day, like the hum of a beehive, interrupted now and then by the authoritative voice of the master, in the tone of menace or command or peradventure by the appalling sound of the birch, as he urged some tardy loiterer along the flowery path of knowledge. Truth to say, he was a conscientious man, and ever bore in mind the golden maxim, Spare the rod, and spoil the child. Ichabod Crane's scholars certainly were not spoiled. I would not have it imagined, however, that he was one of those cruel potentates of the school, who joy in the smart of their subjects. On the contrary, he administered justice, with discrimination rather than severity, taking the burden off the backs of the weak, and laying it on those of the strong. Your mere puny stripling, that winced at the least flourish of the rod, was passed by with indulgence, but the claims of justice were satisfied by inflicting a double portion on some little tough, wrong-headed, broad-skirted Dutch urchin, 
who sulked and swelled and grew dogged and sullen beneath the birch all this he called doing his duty by their parents and he never inflicted a chastisement without following it by the assurance so consolatory to the smarting urchin that he would remember it and thank him for the longest day he had to live when school hours were over he was even the companion and playmate of the larger boys and on holiday afternoons would convoy some of the smaller ones home who happened to have pretty sisters or good housewives for mothers noted for the comforts of the cupboard indeed it behooved him to keep on good terms with his pupils the revenue arising from his school was small and would have been scarcely sufficient to furnish him with daily bread for he was a huge feeder and though lank had the dilating powers of an anaconda but to help out his maintenance he was according to country custom in those parts boarded and lodged at the houses of the farmers whose children he instructed with these he lived successively a week at a time thus going the rounds of the neighborhood with all his worldly effects tied up in a cotton handkerchief that all this might not be too onerous on the purses of his rustic patrons who are apt to consider the cost of schooling a grievous burden and schoolmasters as mere drones he had various ways of rendering himself both useful and agreeable he assisted the farmers occasionally in the lighter labors of their farms helped to make hay mended the fences took the horses to water drove the cows from pasture and cut wood for the winter fire he laid aside too all the dominant dignity and absolute sway with which he lorded it in his little empire the school and became wonderfully gentle and ingratiating he found favor in the eyes of the mothers by petting the children particularly the youngest and like the lion bold which willem so magnanimously the lamb did hold he would sit with a child on one knee and rock a cradle with his foot for whole hours together in addition to his other vocations he was the singing master of the neighborhood and picked up many bright shillings by instructing the young folks in psalmody it was a matter of no little vanity to him on sundays to take his station in front of the church gallery with a band of chosen singers where in his own mind he completely carried away the palm from the parson certain it is his voice resounded far above all the rest of the congregation and there are peculiar quavers still to be heard in that church and which may even be heard half a mile off quite to the opposite side of the mill pond on a still sunday morning which are said to be legitimately descended from the nose of ichabod crane thus by diverse little makeshifts in that ingenious way which is commonly denominated by hook and by crook the worthy pedagogue got on tolerably enough and was thought by all who understood nothing of the labor of headwork to have a wonderfully easy life of it the schoolmaster is generally a man of some importance in the female circle of a rural neighborhood being considered a kind of idle gentlemanlike personage of vastly superior taste and accomplishments to the rough country swains and indeed inferior in learning only to the parson his appearance therefore is apt to occasion some little stir at the tea-table of a farmhouse in the addition of a supernumerary dish of cakes or sweetmeats or peradventure the parade of a silver teapot our man of letters therefore was peculiarly happy in the smiles of all the country damsels how he would figure among them in the churchyard between services on sundays gathering grapes for them from the wild vines that overrun the surrounding trees reciting for their amusement all the epitaphs on the tombstones or sauntering 
with a whole bevy of them along the banks of the adjacent mill pond while the more bashful country bumpkins hung sheepishly back envying his superior elegance and address from his half itinerant life also he was a kind of travelling gazette carrying the whole budget of local gossip from house to house so that his appearance was always greeted with satisfaction he was moreover esteemed by the women as a man of great erudition for he had read several books quite through and was a perfect master of cotton mather's history of new england witchcraft and which by the way he most firmly and potently believed he was in fact an odd mixture of small shrewdness and simple credulity his appetite for the marvellous and his powers of digesting it were equally extraordinary and both had been increased by his residence in this spellbound region no tale was too gross or monstrous for his capacious swallow it was often his delight after his school was dismissed in the afternoon to stretch himself on the rich bed of clover bordering the little brook that whimpered by his schoolhouse and there con over old mather's direful tales until the gathering dusk of the evening made the printed page a mere mist before his eyes then as he wended his way by swamp and stream and awful woodland to the farmhouse where he happened to be quartered every sound of nature at that witching hour fluttered his excited imagination the moan of the whippoorwill the whippoorwill is a bird which is only heard at night it receives its name from its note which is thought to resemble those words from the hillside the boding cry of the tree toad that harbinger of storm the dreary hooting of the screech owl or the sudden rustling in the thicket of birds frightened from their roost the fireflies too which sparkled most vividly in the darkest places now and then startled him as one of uncommon brightness would stream across his path and if by chance a huge blockhead of a beetle came winging his blundering flight against him the poor varlet was ready to give up the ghost with the idea that he was struck with a witch's token his only resource on such occasions either to drown thought or drive away evil spirits was to sing psalm tunes and the good people of sleepy hollow as they sat by their doors of an evening were often filled with awe at hearing his nasal melody and linked sweetness long drawn out floating from the distant hill or along the dusky road another of his sources of fearful pleasure was to pass long winter evenings with the old dutch wives as they sat spinning by the fire with a row of apples roasting and spluttering along the hearth and listened to their marvellous tales of ghosts and goblins and haunted fields and haunted brooks and haunted bridges and haunted houses and particularly of the headless horseman or galloping hessian of the hollow as they sometimes called him he would delight them equally by his anecdotes of witchcraft and of the direful omens and portentous sights and sounds in the air which prevailed in the earlier times of connecticut and would frighten them woefully with speculation upon comets and shooting stars and with the alarming fact that the world did absolutely turn round and they were half the time topsy-turvy but if there was a pleasure in all this while snugly cuddling in the chimney corner of a chamber that was all of a ruddy glow from the crackling wood fire and where of course no spectre dared to show its face it was dearly purchased by the terrors of his subsequent walk homewards what fearful shapes and shadows beset his path amidst the dim and ghastly glare of a snowy night with what wistful look did he eye every trembling ray of light streaming across the waste fields from some distant window how often was he appalled by some shrub covered with snow which like a sheeted spectre beset his very path how often did he shrink 
with curdling awe at the sound of his own steps on the frosty crust beneath his feet and dread to look over his shoulder lest he should behold some uncouth being tramping close behind him and how often was he thrown into complete dismay by some rushing blast howling among the trees in the idea that it was the galloping hessian on one of his nightly scourings all these however were mere terrors of the night phantoms of the mind that walk in darkness though he had seen many spectres in his time and been more than once beset by satan in diverse shapes in his lonely perambulations yet daylight put an end to all these evils and he would have passed the pleasant life of it in despite of the devil and all his works if his path had not been crossed by a being that causes more perplexity to mortal man than ghosts goblins and the whole race of witches put together and that was a woman among the musical disciples who assembled one evening in each week to receive his instructions in psalmody was katerina van tassel the daughter and only child of a substantial dutch farmer she was a blooming lass of fresh eighteen plump as a partridge ripe and melting and rosy-cheeked as one of her father's peaches and universally famed not merely for her beauty but her vast expectations she was withal a little of a coquette as might be perceived even in her dress which was a mixture of ancient and modern fashions as most suited to set off her charms she wore the ornaments of pure yellow gold which her great-great-grandmother had brought over from sardam the tempting stomacher of the olden time and withal a provokingly short petticoat to display the prettiest foot and ankle in the country round ichabod crane had a soft and foolish heart towards the sex and it is not to be wondered at that so tempting a morsel soon found favour in his eyes more especially after he had visited her in her paternal mansion old baltus von tassel was a perfect picture of a thriving contented liberal-hearted farmer he seldom it is true sent either his eyes or his thoughts beyond the boundaries of his own farm but within those everything was snug happy and well conditioned he was satisfied with his wealth but not proud of it and piqued himself upon the hearty abundance rather than the style in which he lived his stronghold was situated on the banks of the hudson in one of those green sheltered fertile nooks in which the dutch farmers are so fond of nestling a great elm tree spread its broad branches over it at the foot of which bubbled up a spring of the softest and sweetest water in a little well formed of a barrel and then stole sparkling away through the grass to a neighboring brook that bubbled along among alders and dwarf willows hard by the farmhouse was a vast barn that might have served for a church every window and crevice of which seemed bursting forth with the treasures of the farm the flail was busily resounding within it from morning to night swallows and martins skimmed twittering about the eaves and rows of pigeons some with one eye turned up as if watching the weather some with their heads under their wings were buried in their bosoms and others swelling and cooing and bowing about their dames were enjoying the sunshine on the roof sleek unwieldy porkers were grunting in the repose and abundance of their pens whence sallied forth now and then troops of sucking pigs as if to snuff the air a stately squadron of snowy geese were riding in an adjoining pond convoying whole fleets of ducks regiments of turkeys were gobbling through the farmyard and guinea fowls fretted about like ill-tempered housewives with their peevish discontented cry before the barn door strutted the gallant cock that pattern of a husband a warrior and a fine gentleman clapping his burnished wings and crowing in the pride and gladness of his heart sometimes tearing up the earth with his feet 
and then generously calling his ever-hungry family of wives and children to enjoy the rich morsel which he had discovered. End of Section 5 The Legend of Sleepy Hollow Part 1 By Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section 6 of Selected Classics of Washington Irving by Washington Irving. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano. Section 6 The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Part 2. The pedagogue's mouth watered as he looked upon this sumptuous promise of luxurious winter fare. In his devouring mind's eye, he pictured to himself every roasting pig running about with a pudding in his belly and an apple in his mouth. The pigeons were snugly put to bed in a comfortable pie and tucked in with a coverlet of crust. The geese were swimming in their own gravy and the ducks pairing cosily in dishes like snug married couples with a decent competency of onion sauce. In the porkers he saw carved out the future sleek side of bacon and juicy relishing ham. Not a turkey, but he beheld daintily trussed up, with its gizzard under its wing, and, peradventure, a necklace of savory sausages, and even bright Chancellor himself lay sprawling on his back in a side dish, with uplifted claws, as if craving that quarter which his chivalrous spirit disdained to ask while living. As the enraptured Ichabod fancied all this, and as he rolled his great green eyes over the fat meadow lands, the rich fields of wheat, of rye, of buckwheat, and Indian corn, and the orchards burdened with ruddy fruit, which surrounded the warm tenement of Van Tassel. His heart yearned after the damsel who was to inherit these domains, and his imagination expanded with the idea how they might be readily turned into cash, and the money invested in immense tracts of wild land and shingle palaces in the wilderness. Nay, his busy fancy already realized his hopes, and presented to him the blooming Katerina, with a whole family of children, mounted on the top of a wagon, loaded with household trumpery, with pots and kettles dangling beneath, and he beheld himself bestriding a pacing mare, with a colt at her heels, setting out for Kentucky, Tennessee, or the Lord knows where. When he entered the house the conquest of his heart was complete, it was one of those spacious farmhouses, with high-ridged but lowly sloping roofs, built in the style handed down from the first Dutch settlers, the low projecting eaves forming a piazza along the front capable of being closed up in bad weather. Under this were hung flails, harness, various utensils of husbandry, and nets for fishing in the neighboring river. Benches were built along the sides for summer use, and a great spinning wheel at one end, and a churn at the other, showed the various uses to which this important porch might be devoted. From this piazza the wandering Ichabod entered the hall, which formed the center of the mansion, and the place of usual residence. Here rows of resplendent pewter, ranged on a long dresser, dazzled his eyes. In one corner stood a huge bag of wool ready to be spun. In another a quantity of linsey woolsey just from the loom, ears of Indian corn and strings of dried apples and peaches hung in gay festoons along the walls, mingled with the god of red peppers, and a door left ajar gave him a peep into the best parlor where the claw-footed chairs and dark mahogany tables 
shone like mirrors and irons with their accompanying shovel and tongs glistened from their covert of asparagus tops mock oranges and conch shells decorated the mantelpiece strings of various colored birds eggs were suspended above it a great ostrich egg was hung from the center of the room and a corner cupboard knowingly left open displayed immense treasures of old silver and well-mended china from the moment ichabod laid his eyes upon these regions of delight the peace of his mind was at an end and his only study was how to gain the affections of the peerless daughter of van tassel in this enterprise however he had more real difficulties than generally fell to the lot of a knight-errant of yore who seldom had anything but giants enchanters fiery dragons and such like easily conquered adversaries to contend with and had to make his way merely through gates of iron and brass and walls of adamant to the castle keep where the lady of his heart was confined all of which he achieved as easily as a man would carve his way to the centre of a christmas pie and then the lady gave him her hand as a matter of course ichabod on the contrary had to win his way to the heart of a country coquette beset with a labyrinth of whims and caprices which were forever presenting new difficulties and impediments and he had to encounter a host of fearful adversaries of real flesh and blood the numerous rustic admirers who beset every portal to her heart keeping a watchful and angry eye upon each other but ready to fly out in the common cause against any new competitor among these the most formidable was a burly roaring roistering blade of the name of abraham or according to the dutch abbreviation brahm van brunt the hero of the country round which rang with his feats of strength and hardihood he was broad-shouldered and double-jointed with short curly black hair and a bluff but not unpleasant countenance having a mingled air of fun and arrogance from his herculean frame and great powers of limb he had received the nickname of brom bones by which he was universally known he was famed for great knowledge and skill in horsemanship being as dexterous on horseback as a tartar he was foremost at all races and cockfights and with the ascendancy which bodily strength acquires in rustic life was the umpire in all disputes setting his hat on one side and giving his decisions with an air and tone admitting of no gainsay or appeal he was always ready for either a fight or a frolic but had more mischief than ill-will in his composition and with all his overbearing roughness there was a strong dash of waggish good humour at bottom he had three or four boon companions who regarded him as their model and at the head of whom he scouted the country attending every scene of feud or merriment for miles around in cold weather he was distinguished by a fur cap surmounted with a flaunting fox's tail and when the folks at a country gathering decried this well-known crest at a distance whisking about among a squad of hard riders they always stood by for a squall sometimes his crew would be heard dashing along past the farmhouses at midnight with a whoop and halloo like a troop of don cossacks and the old dames startled out of their sleep would listen for a moment till the hurry scurry had clattered by and then exclaim ah there goes brown bones and his gang the neighbors looked upon him with a mixture of awe admiration and good will and when any madcap prank or rustic brawl occurred in the vicinity always shook their heads and warranted brown bones was at the bottom of it this rantipole hero had for some time singled out the blooming katrina for the object of his uncouth gallantries and though his amorous toyings were something like the gentle caresses and endearments of a bear yet it was whispered that she did not altogether discourage his hopes certain it is his advances were signals for rival candidates to retire who felt no inclination to cross a line in his amours 
insomuch that when his horse was seen tied to Van Tassel's paling on a Sunday night, a sure sign that his master was courting, or, as it is termed, sparking, within, all other suitors passed by in despair, and carried the war into other quarters. Such was the formidable rival with whom Ichabod Crane had to contend. And, considering all things, a stouter man than he would have shrunk from the competition, and a wiser man would have despaired. He had, however, a happy mixture of pliability and perseverance in his nature. He was in form and spirit like a supple jack, yielding, but although, though he bent, he never broke, and though he bowed beneath the slightest pressure, yet the moment it was away, jerk, he was as erect, and carried his head as high as ever. To have taken the field openly against his rival would have been madness, for he was not man to be thwarted in his amours, any more than that stormy lover, Achilles. Ichabod, therefore, made his advances in a quiet and gently insinuating manner. Under cover of his character of singing-master, he made frequent visits at the farmhouse. Not that he had anything to apprehend from the meddlesome interference of parents, which is so often a stumbling block in the path of lovers. Balt von Tassel was an easy, indulgent soul. He loved his daughter better, even, than his pipe, and, like a reasonable man and an excellent father, let her have her way in everything. His notable little wife, too, had enough to do to attend to her housekeeping and manage her poultry for, as she sagely observed, ducks and geese are foolish things, and must be looked after, but girls can take care of themselves. Thus, while the busy dame bustled about the house, or plied her spinning wheel at one end of the piazza, honest Balt would sit smoking his evening pipe at the other, watching the achievements of a little wooden warrior, who, armed with a sword in each hand, was most valiantly fighting the wind on the pinnacle of the barn. In the meantime, Ichabod would carry on his suit with the daughter by the side of the spring, under the great elm, or sauntering along in the twilight, that hour so favorable to the lover's eloquence. I profess not to know how women's hearts are wooed and won. To me, they have always been matters of riddle and admiration. Some seem to have but one vulnerable point, or door of access, while others have a thousand avenues, and may be captured in a thousand different ways. It is a great triumph of skill to gain the former, but still greater proof of generalship to maintain possession of the latter, for the man must battle for his fortress at every door and window. He who wins a thousand common hearts is therefore entitled to some renown, but he who keeps undisputed sway over the heart of a coquette is indeed a hero. Certain it is, this was not the case with the redoubtable brown bones and from the moment Ichabod Crane made his advances, the interests of the former evidently declined. His horse was no longer seen tied at the palings on Sunday nights, and a deadly feud gradually arose between him and the preceptor of Sleepy Hollow. Brahm, who had a degree of rough chivalry in his nature, would fain have carried matters to open warfare and have settled their pretensions to the lady, according to the mode of those most concise and simple reasoners, the knights errant of yore, by single combat. But Ichabod was too conscious of the superior might of his adversary to enter the lists against him. He had overheard a boast of bones that he would double the schoolmaster up and lay him on a shelf of his own schoolhouse, and he was too wary to give him an opportunity. There was something extremely provoking in this obstinately pacific system. It left Brom no alternative but to draw upon the funds of rustic waggery in his disposition and to play off boorish practical jokes upon his rival. Ichabod became the object of whimsical persecution to Bones and his gang of rough riders. 
they harried his hitherto peaceful domains, smoked out his singing school by stopping up the chimney, broke into the schoolhouse at night, in spite of its formidable fastenings of with and window stakes, and turned everything topsy turvy, so that the poor schoolmaster began to think all the witches in the country held their meetings there. But, what was still more annoying, Brom took all opportunities of turning him into ridicule in presence of his mistress, and had a scoundrel dog, whom he taught to whine in the most ludicrous manner, and introduced as a rival of Ichabod's, to instruct her in psalmody. In this way matters went on for some time, without producing any material effect on the relative situation of the contending powers. On a fine autumnal afternoon, Ichabod, in pensive mood, sat enthroned on the lofty stool whence he usually watched all the concerns of his little literary realm. In his hand he swayed a furrel, that scepter of despotic power, the birch of justice reposed on three nails behind the throne, a constant terror to evil doers, while on the desk before him might be seen sundry contraband articles, and prohibited weapons detected upon the persons of idle urchins, such as half-munched apples, pop-guns, whirligigs, fly-cages, and whole legions of rampant little paper gamecocks. Apparently there had been some appalling act of justice recently inflicted, for his scholars were all busily intent upon their books, or slyly whispering behind them with one eye kept upon the master and a kind of buzzing stillness reigned throughout the schoolroom. It was suddenly interrupted by the appearance of a negro in toe-clothed jacket and trousers, a round-crowned fragment of a hat, like the cap of mercury, and mounted on the back of a ragged, wild, half-broken colt, which he managed with a rope by way of halter. He came clattering up to the school door with an invitation to Ichabod, to attend a merry-making, or quilting frolic, to be held that evening at Menheer von Tassel's, and, having delivered his message with that air of importance and effort at fine language, which a negro was apt to display on petty embassies of the kind, he dashed over the brook, and was seen scampering away up the hollow, full of the importance and hurry of his mission. All was now bustle and hubbub in the late, quiet schoolroom. The scholars were hurried through their lessons without stopping at trifles. Those who were nimble skipped over half with impunity, and those who were tardy had a smart application now and then in the rear to quicken their speed or help them over a tall word. Books were flung aside without being put away on the shelves. Inkstands were overturned benches thrown down, and the whole school was turned loose an hour before the usual time, bursting forth like a legion of young imps, yelping and racketing about the green, in joy at their early emancipation. The gallant Ichabod now spent at least an extra half-hour at his toilet, brushing and furbishing up his best, and indeed only suit of rusty black, and arranging his locks by a bit of broken-looking glass, that hung up in the schoolhouse, that he might make his appearance before his mistress in the true style of a cavalier. He borrowed a horse from the farmer with whom he was domiciliated, a choleric old Dutchman of the name of Hans von Ripper, and, thus gallantly mounted, issued forth like a knight-errant in quest of adventures. But it is meet I should, in the true spirit of romantic story, give some account of the looks and equipments of my hero and his steed. The animal he bestrode was a broken-down plough-horse that had outlived almost everything but his viciousness. He was gaunt and shagged, with a ewe neck and a head like a hammer. His rusty mane and tail were tangled and knotted with burrs. One eye had lost its pupil and was glaring and spectral but the other had the gleam of a genuine devil in it. Still, he must have had fire and metal in his day, if we may judge from the name he bore of gunpowder. He had, in fact, been a favorite steed of his master's, 
the choleric Van Ripper, who was a furious rider, and had infused, very probably, some of his own spirit into the animal, for, old and broken down as he looked, there was more of the lurking devil in him than in any young filly in the country. Ichabod was a suitable figure for such a steed. He rode with short stirrups, which brought his knees nearly up to the pommel of the saddle. His sharp elbows stuck out like grasshoppers. He carried his whip particularly in his hand like a scepter, and as his horse jogged on, the motion of his arms was not unlike the flapping of a pair of wings. A small wool hat rested on the top of his nose, for so his scanty strip of forehead might be called, and the skirts of his black coat fluttered out almost to his horse's tail. Such was the appearance of Ichabod, and his steed as they shambled out of the gate of Hans von Ripper, and it was altogether such an apparition as is seldom to be met with in broad daylight. It was, as I have said, a fine autumnal day. The sky was clear and serene, and nature wore that rich and golden livery which we always associate with the idea of abundance. The forests had put on their sober brown and yellow, while some trees of the tenderer kind had been nipped by the frosts into brilliant dyes of orange, purple, and scarlet. Streaming files of wild ducks began to make their appearance high in the air. The bark of the squirrel might be heard from the groves of beech and hickory nuts, and the pensive whistle of the quail at intervals from the neighboring stubble field. The small birds were taking their farewell banquets. In the fullness of their revelry, they fluttered, chirping and frolicking, from bush to bush and tree to tree, capricious from the very profusion and variety around them. There was the honest cock-robin, the favorite game of stripling sportsmen, with its loud querulous note, and the twittering blackbirds, flying in sable clouds, and the golden-winged woodpecker, with his crimson crest, his broad black gorget, and splendid plumage, and the cedar-bird, with its red-tipped wings, and yellow-tipped tail, and its little Montero cap of feathers, and the blue jay, that noisy coxcomb, and his gay light-blue coat, and white underclothes, screaming and chattering, bobbing and nodding and bowing, and pretending to be on good terms with every songster of the grove. As Ichabod jogged slowly on his way, his eye, ever open to every symptom of culinary abundance, ranged with delight over the treasures of jolly autumn. On all sides he beheld vast store of apples, some hanging in oppressive opulence on the trees, some gathered into baskets and barrels for the market, others heaped up in rich piles for the cider press. Farther on he beheld great fields of Indian corn, with its golden ears peeping from their leafy coverts and holding out the promise of cakes and hasty pudding, and the yellow pumpkins lying beneath them, turning up their fair round bellies to the sun, and giving ample prospects of the most luxurious of pies. And anon he passed the fragrant buckwheat fields, breathing the odor of the beehive, and as he beheld them, soft anticipation stole over his mind of dainty slapjacks, well buttered and garnished with honey or treacle by the delicate little dimpled hand of Katrina Van Tossel. Thus feeding his mind with many sweet thoughts and sugared suppositions, he journeyed along the sides of a range of hills which look out upon some of the goodliest scenes of the mighty Hudson. The sun gradually wheeled his broad disk down into the west. The wide bosom of the Tappan Zee lay motionless and glassy, excepting that here and there a gentle undulation waved and prolonged the blue shadow of the distant mountain. A few amber clouds floated in the sky, without a breath of air to move them. The horizon was of a fine golden tint, changing gradually into a pure apple green, and from that into the deep blue of the mid-heaven. A slanting ray lingered on the woody crests of the precipices that overhung some parts of the river, giving greater depth to the dark gray and purple 
of their rocky sides. A sloop was loitering in the distance, dropping slowly down with the tide, her sail hanging uselessly against the mast, and as the reflection of the sky gleamed along the still water, it seemed as if the vessel was suspended in the air. End of Section 6 The Legend of Sleepy Hollow Part 2 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section 7 of Selected Classics of Washington Irving by Washington Irving This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Greg Giordano The Legend of Sleepy Hollow Part 3 It was toward evening that Ichabod arrived at the castle of Herr von Tassel, which he found thronged with the pride and flower of the adjacent country, old farmers, a spare leathern-faced race, in homespun coats and breeches, blue stockings, huge shoes, and magnificent pewter buckles, their brisk withered little dames, in close crimped caps, long-waisted short gowns, homespun petticoats with scissors and pincushions, and gay calico pockets hanging on the outside, buxom lasses, almost as antiquated as their mothers, excepting where a straw hat, a fine ribbon, or perhaps a white frock, gave symptoms of city innovation. The sons, in short square skirted coats, with rows of stupendous brass buttons, and their hair generally cued in the fashion of the times, especially if they could procure an eel-skin for the purpose, it being esteemed throughout the country, as a potent nourisher and strengthener of the hair. Brom Bones, however, was the hero of the scene, having come to the gathering on his favorite steed, Daredevil, a creature like himself full of metal and mischief, in which no one but himself could manage. He was, in fact, noted for preferring vicious animals, given to all kinds of tricks which kept the rider in constant risk of his neck, for he held a tractable, well-broken horse as unworthy of a lad of spirit. Fain would I pause to dwell upon the world of charms that burst upon the enraptured gaze of my hero as he entered the state parlor of Von Tassel's mansion, not those of the bevy of buxom lasses with their luxurious display of red and white, but the ample charms of a genuine Dutch country tea-table in the sumptuous time of autumn, such heaped-up platters of cakes of various and almost indescribable kinds, known only to experienced Dutch housewives. There was the doughty doughnut, the tenderer oily cock, and the crisp and crumbling cruller, sweet cakes and short cakes, ginger cakes and honey cakes, and the whole family of cakes. And then there were apple pies, and peach pies, and pumpkin pies, besides slices of ham and smoked beef, and moreover delectable dishes of preserved plums and peaches, and pears and quinces, not to mention broiled shad and roasted chickens, together with bowls of milk and cream, all mingled higgledy-piggledy, pretty much as I have enumerated them with the motherly teapot sending up its clouds of vapor from the midst. Heaven bless the mark! I want breath and time to discuss this banquet as it deserves, and am too eager to get on with my story. Happily, Ichabod Crane was not in so great a hurry as his historian, but did ample justice to every dainty. He was a kind and thankful creature, whose heart dilated in proportion as his skin was filled with good cheer, and whose spirits rose with eating, as some men's do with drink. He could not help, too, rolling his large eyes round him as he ate, 
and chuckling with the possibility that he might one day be lord of all this scene of almost unimaginable luxury and splendor then he thought how soon he'd turn his back upon the old schoolhouse snap his fingers in the face of hans von ripper and every other niggardly patron and kick any itinerant pedagogue out of doors that should dare to call him comrade old baltus von tassel moved about among his guests with a face dilated with content and good humour round and jolly as the harvest moon his hospitable attentions were brief but expressive being confined to a shake of the hand a slap on the shoulder a loud laugh and a pressing invitation to fall to and help themselves and now the sound of the music from the common room or hall summoned to the dance the musician was an old gray-headed negro who had been the itinerant orchestra of the neighborhood for more than a half a century his instrument was as old and battered as himself the greater part of the time he scraped on two or three strings accompanying every movement of the bow with a motion of the head bowing almost to the ground and stamping with his foot whenever a fresh couple were to start ichabod prided himself upon his dancing as much upon his vocal powers not a limb not a fibre about him was idle and to have seen his loosely hung frame in full motion and clattering about the room you would have thought st vitus himself that blessed patron of the dance was figuring before you in person he was the admiration of all the negroes who having gathered of all ages and sizes from the farm in the neighborhood stood forming a pyramid of shining black faces at every door and window gazing with delight at the scene rolling their white eyeballs and showing grinning rows of ivory from ear to ear how could the flogger of urchins be otherwise than animated and joyous the lady of his heart was his partner in the dance and smiling graciously in reply to all his amorous oglings while brown bones sorely smitten with love and jealousy sat brooding by himself in one corner when the dance was at an end ichabod was attracted to a knot of the sager folks who with old von tassel sat smoking at one end of the piazza gossiping over former times and drawing out long stories about the war this neighborhood at the time of which i am speaking was one of those highly favored places which abound with chronicle and great men the british and american line had run near it during the war it had therefore been the scene of marauding and infested with refugees cowboys and all kinds of border chivalry just sufficient time had elapsed to enable each story-teller to dress up his tale with a little becoming fiction and in the indistinctness of his recollection to make himself the hero of every exploit there was the story of dafu martling a large blue-bearded dutchman who had nearly taken a british frigate with an old iron nine-pounder from a mud breastwork only that his gun burst at the sixth discharge and there was an old gentleman who shall be nameless being too rich a minhaer to be lightly mentioned who in the battle of white plains being an excellent master of defence parried a musket ball with a small sword insomuch that he absolutely felt it whiz round the blade and glance off at the hilt in proof of which he was ready at any time to show the sword with the hilt a little bent there were several more that had been equally great in the field not one of whom but was persuaded that he had considerable hand in bringing the war to a happy termination but all these were nothing to the tales of ghosts and apparitions that succeeded the neighborhood is rich in legendary treasures of the kind local tales and superstitions thrive best in these sheltered long settled retreats but are trampled under foot by the shifting throng that forms the population of most of our country places besides there is no encouragement for ghosts in most of our villages for they have scarcely had time to finish their first nap and turn themselves in their graves before their surviving friends have travelled away from the neighbourhood 
so that when they turn out at night to walk their rounds, they have no acquaintance left to call upon. This is perhaps the reason why we so seldom hear of ghosts except in our long-established Dutch communities. The immediate causes, however, of the prevalence of supernatural stories in these parts was doubtless owing to the vicinity of Sleepy Hollow. There was a contagion in the very air that blew from that haunted region. It breathed forth an atmosphere of dreams and fancies, infecting all the land. Several of the Sleepy Hollow people were present at Von Tassel's, and, as usual, were doling out their wild and wonderful legends. Many dismal tales were told about funeral trains and mourning cries and wailings heard and seen about the great tree where the unfortunate Major Andre was taken, and which stood in the neighborhood. Some mention was made also of the woman in white that haunted the dark glen at Raven Rock, and was often heard to shriek on winter nights before a storm, having perished there in the snow. The chief part of the stories, however, turned upon the favorite specter of Sleepy Hollow, the headless horseman, who had been heard several times of late patrolling the country, and, it was said, tethered his horse nightly among the graves in the churchyard. The sequestered situation of this church seems always to have made it a favorite haunt of troubled spirits. It stands on a knoll surrounded by locust trees and lofty elms, from among which its decent whitewashed walls shine modestly forth, like Christian purity beaming through the shades of retirement. A gentle slope descends from it to a silver sheet of water, bordered by high trees, between which peeps may be caught at the blue hills of the Hudson. To look upon its grass-grown yard, where the sunbeam seems to sleep so quietly, one would think that there at least the dead might rest in peace. On one side of the church extends a wide woody dell, along which raves a large brook among broken rocks and trunks of fallen trees. Over a deep black part of the stream, not far from the church, was formerly thrown a wooden bridge. The road that led to it and the bridge itself were thickly shaded by overhanging trees, which cast a gloom about it even in the daytime but occasioned a fearful darkness at night. Such was one of the favorite haunts of the headless horseman, and the place where he was most frequently encountered. The tale was told of old Brower, a most heretical disbeliever in ghosts, how he met the horseman returning from his foray into Sleepy Hollow, and was obliged to get up behind him, how they galloped over bush and brake, over hill and swamp, until they reached the bridge when the horseman suddenly turned into a skeleton, threw old Brower into the brook, and sprang away over the treetops with a clap of thunder. This story was immediately matched by a thrice marvellous adventure of Brown Bones, who made light of the galloping Hessian as an errant jockey. He affirmed that on returning one night from the neighboring village of Sing Sing, he had been overtaken by this midnight trooper, that he had offered to race with him for a bowl of punch, and should have won it, too, for Daredevil beat the goblin horse all hollow. But just as they came to the church bridge, the Hessian bolted and vanished in a flash of fire. All these tales, told in that drowsy undertone with which men talk in the dark, the countenances of the listeners, only now and then receiving a casual gleam from the glare of a pipe, sank deep in the mind of Ichabod. He repaid them in kind with large extracts from his invaluable author, Cotton Mather, and added many marvelous events that had taken place in his native state of Connecticut, and fearful sights which he had seen in his nightly walks about Sleepy Hollow. The revel now gradually broke up. The old farmers gathered together their families in their wagons, and were heard for some time rattling along the hollow roads and over the distant hills. Some of the damsels mounted on pillions, behind their favorite swains, and their light-hearted laughter, mingling with the clatter of hoofs, echoed along the silent woodlands, sounding fainter and fainter until they gradually died away. 
and the late scene of noise and frolic was all silent and deserted ichabod only lingered behind according to the custom of country lovers to have a tete -a -tete with the heiress fully convinced that he was now on the high road to success what passed at this interview i will not pretend to say for in fact i do not know something however i fear me must have gone wrong for he certainly sallied forth after no very great interval with an air quite desolate and chop-fallen oh these women these women could that girl have been playing off any of her coquettish tricks was her encouragement of the poor pedagogue all a mere sham to secure her conquest of his rival heaven only knows not i let it suffice to say ichabod stole forth with the air of one who had been sacking a hen-roost rather than a fair lady's heart without looking to the right or left to notice the scene of rural wealth of which he had so often gloated he went straight to the stable and with several hearty cuffs and kicks roused his steed most uncourteously from the comfortable quarters in which he was soundly sleeping dreaming of mountains of corn and oats and whole valleys of timothy and clover it was the very witching time of night that ichabod heavy-hearted and crestfallen pursued his travel homewards along the sides of the lofty hills which rise above tarry town and which he had traversed so cheerily in the afternoon the hour was as dismal as himself far below him the tappan zee spread its dusky and indistinct waste of waters with here and there the tall mast of a sloop riding quietly at anchor under the land in the dead hush of midnight he could even hear the barking of the watch-dog from the opposite shore of the hudson but it was so vague and faint as only to give an idea of his distance from this faithful companion of man now and then too the long-drawn crowing of a cock accidentally awakened would sound far far off from some farmhouse away among the hills but it was like a dreaming sound in his ear no signs of life occurred near him but occasionally the melancholy chirp of a cricket or perhaps the guttural twang of a bullfrog from a neighboring marsh as if sleeping uncomfortably and turning suddenly in his bed all the stories of ghosts and goblins that he had heard in the afternoon now came crowding upon his recollection the night grew darker and darker the stars seemed to sink deeper in the sky and driving clouds occasionally hid them from his sight he had never felt so lonely and dismal he was moreover approaching the very place where many of the scenes of the ghost stories had been laid in the centre of the road stood an enormous tulip tree which towered like a giant above all the other trees of the neighbourhood and formed a kind of landmark its limbs were gnarled and fantastic large enough to form trunks for ordinary trees twisting down almost to the earth and rising again into the air it was connected with the tragical story of the unfortunate andre who had been taken prisoner hard by and was universally known by the name of major andre's tree the common people regarded it with a mixture of respect and superstition partly out of sympathy for the fate of its ill-starred namesake and partly from the tales of strange sights and doleful lamentations told concerning it as ichabod approached this fearful tree he began to whistle he thought his whistle was answered as it was but a blast sweeping sharply through the dry branches as he approached a little nearer he thought he saw something white hanging in the midst of the tree he paused and ceased whistling but on looking more narrowly perceived that it was a place where the tree had been scathed by lightning and the white wood laid bare suddenly he heard a groan his teeth chattered and his knees smote against the saddle it was but the rubbing of one huge bough upon another as they were swayed about by the breeze he passed the tree in safety but new perils lay before him about two hundred yards from the tree a small brook crossed the road and ran into a marshy and thickly wooded glen known by the name of wiley swamp a few rough logs 
laid side by side, served for a bridge over the stream. On that side of the road where the brook entered the wood, a group of oaks and chestnuts, matted thick with wild grape vines, threw a cavernous gloom over it. To pass this bridge was the severest trial. It was at this identical spot that the unfortunate Andre was captured, and under the covert of those chestnuts and vines were the sturdy yeomen concealed who surprised him. This has ever since been considered a haunted stream, and fearful are the feelings of the schoolboy who has to pass it alone after dark. As he approached the stream his heart began to thump. He summoned up, however, all his resolution, gave his horse half a score of kicks in the ribs, and attempted to dash briskly across the bridge. But instead of starting forward, the perverse old animal made a lateral movement, and ran broadside against the fence. Ichabod, whose fears increased with the delay, jerked the reins on the other side, and kicked lustily with the contrary foot. It was all in vain. His steed started, it is true, but it was only to plunge to the opposite side of the road into a thicket of brambles and alder bushes. The schoolmaster now bestowed both whip and heel upon the starveling ribs of old Gunpowder, who dashed forward, snuffing and snorting, but came to a stand just by the bridge with a suddenness that had nearly sent his rider sprawling over his head. Just at this moment a plashy tramp by the side of the bridge caught the sensitive ear of Ichabod. In the dark shadow of the grove on the margin of the brook he beheld something huge, misshapen, black and towering. It stirred not, but seemed gathered up in the gloom, like some gigantic monster ready to spring upon the traveller. The hair of the affrighted pedagogue rose upon his head with terror. What was to be done? To turn and fly was now too late, and besides, what chance was there of escaping ghost or goblin, if such it was, which could ride upon the wings of the wind? Summoning up, therefore, a show of courage, he demanded in stammering accents, Who are you? He received no reply. He repeated his demand in a still more agitated voice. Still there was no answer. Once more he cudgelled the sides of the inflexible gunpowder, and, shutting his eyes, broke forth with involuntary fervor into a psalm tune. Just then the shadowy object of alarm put itself in motion, and with a scramble and a bound stood at once in the middle of the road. Though the night was dark and dismal, yet the form of the unknown might now in some degree be ascertained. He appeared to be a horseman of large dimensions, and mounted on a black horse of powerful frame. He made no offer of molestation or sociability, but kept aloof on one side of the road, jogging along on the blind side of old gunpowder, who had now got over his fright and waywardness. Ichabod, who had no relish for the strange midnight companion, and bethought himself of the adventure of brown bones with the galloping Hessian, now quickened his steed in hopes of leaving him behind. The stranger, however, quickened his horse to an equal pace. Ichabod pulled up and fell into a walk, thinking to lag behind. The other did the same. His heart began to sink within him. He endeavored to resume his psalm tune, but his parched tongue clove to the roof of his mouth, and he could not utter a stave. There was something in the moody, and dogged silence of this pertinacious companion that was mysterious and appalling. It was soon fearfully accounted for, on mounting a rising ground, which brought the figure of his fellow traveller to relief against the sky. Gigantic in height, and muffled in a cloak, Ichabod was horror-struck on perceiving that he was headless, but his horror was still more increased on observing that the head which should have rested on his shoulders, was carried before him on the pommel of the saddle. His terror rose to desperation. He rained a shower of kicks and blows upon gunpowder, hoping by a sudden movement to give his companion the slip. But the spectre started full jump with him. Away then they dashed through thick and thin, 
stones flying and sparks flashing at every bound ichabod's flimsy garments fluttered in the air as he stretched his long lank body away over his horse's head in the eagerness of his flight they had now reached the road which turns off to sleepy hollow but gunpowder who seemed possessed with a demon instead of keeping up it made an opposite turn and plunged headlong down hill to the left this road leads through a sandy hollow shaded by trees for about a quarter of a mile where it crosses the bridge famous in goblin story and just beyond swells the green knoll on which stands the whitewashed church as yet the panic of the steed had given his unskilful rider an apparent advantage in the chase but just as he had got halfway through the hollow the girths of the saddle gave away and he felt it slipping from under him he seized it by the pommel and endeavored to hold it firm but in vain and had just time to save himself by clasping old gunpowder round the neck when the saddle fell to the earth and he heard it trampled under foot by his pursuer for a moment the terror of hans von ripper's wrath passed across his mind for it was his sunday saddle but this was no time for petty fears the goblin was heard on his haunches and unskilled rider that he was he had much ado to maintain his seat sometimes slipping on one side sometimes on another and sometimes jolted on the high ridge of his horse's backbone with a violence that he verily feared would cleave him asunder an opening in the trees now cheered him with the hopes that the church bridge was at hand the wavering reflection of a silver star in the bosom of the brook told him that he was not mistaken he saw the walls of the church dimly glaring under the trees beyond he recollected the place where brown bone's ghostly competitor had disappeared if i can but reach that bridge thought ichabod i am safe just then he heard the black steed panting and blowing close behind him he even fancied that he felt his hot breath another convulsive kick in the ribs and old gunpowder sprang upon the bridge he thundered over the resounding planks he gained the opposite side and now ichabod cast a look behind to see if his pursuer should vanish according to rule in a flash of fire and brimstone just then he saw the goblin rising in his stirrups and in the very act of hurling his head at him ichabod endeavored to dodge the horrible missile but too late it encountered his cranium with a tremendous crash he was tumbled headlong into the dust and gunpowder the black steed and the goblin rider passed by like a whirlwind the next morning the old horse was found without his saddle and with the bridle under his feet soberly cropping the grass at his master's gate ichabod did not make his appearance at breakfast dinner hour came but no ichabod the boys assembled at the schoolhouse and strolled idly about the banks of the brook but no schoolmaster hans von ripper now began to feel some uneasiness about the fate of poor ichabod in his saddle an inquiry was set on foot and after diligent investigation they came upon his traces in one part of the road leading to the church was found the saddle trampled in the dirt the tracks of horses hoofs deeply dented in the road and evidently at furious speed were traced to the bridge beyond which on the bank of a broad part of the brook where the water ran deep and black was found the hat of the unfortunate ichabod and close beside it a spattered pumpkin the brook was searched but the body of the schoolmaster was not to be discovered hans von ripper as executor of his estate examined the bundle which contained all his worldly effects it consisted of two shirts and a half two stocks for the neck a pair or two of worsted stockings an old pair of corduroy small clothes a rusty razor a book of psalm tunes full of dog's ears and a broken pitch pipe as to the books and furniture of the schoolhouse they belonged to the community excepting cotton mather's history of witchcraft a new england almanac and a book of dreams and fortune-telling in which last was a sheet of foolscap 
much scribbled and blotted in several fruitless attempts to make a copy of verses in honor of the heiress of von tassel these magic books and the poetic scrawl were forthwith consigned to the flames by hans von ripper who from that time forward determined to send his children no more to school observing that he never knew any good come of the same reading and writing whatever money the schoolmaster possessed and he had received his quarter's pay but a day or two before he must have had about his person at the time of his disappearance the mysterious event caused much speculation at the church on the following sunday knots of gazers and gossips were collected in the churchyard at the bridge and at the spot where the hat and pumpkin had been found the stories of brower of bones and a whole budget of others were called to mind and when they had diligently considered them all and compared them with the symptoms of the present case they shook their heads and came to the conclusion that ichabod had been carried off by the galloping hessian as he was a bachelor and in nobody's debt nobody troubled his head any more about him the school was removed to a different quarter of the hollow and another pedagogue reigned in his stead it is true an old farmer who had been down to new york on a visit several years after and from whom this account of the ghostly adventure was received brought home the intelligence that ichabod crane was still alive that he had left the neighborhood partly through fear of the goblin and hans von ripper and partly in mortification at having been suddenly dismissed by the heiress that he had changed his quarters to a distant part of the country had kept school and studied law at the same time had been admitted to the bar turned politician electioneered written for the newspapers and finally had been made a justice of the ten-pound court brown bones too who shortly after his rival's disappearance conducted the blooming katrina in triumph to the altar was observed to look exceedingly knowing whenever the story of ichabod was related and always burst into a hearty laugh at the mention of the pumpkin which led some to suspect that he knew more about the matter than he chose to tell the old country wives however who were the best judges of these matters maintain to this day that ichabod was spirited away by supernatural means and it is a favorite story often told about the neighborhood round the intervening fire the bridge became more than ever an object of superstitious awe and that may be the reason why the road has been altered of late years so as to approach the church by the border of the mill pond the schoolhouse being deserted soon fell to decay and it was reported to be haunted by the ghost of the unfortunate pedagogue and the ploughboy loitering homeward of a still summer evening has often fancied his voice at a distance chanting a melody psalm tune among the tranquil solitudes of sleepy hollow postscript found in the handwriting of mr knickerbocker the preceding tale is given almost in the precise words in which i heard it related at a corporation meeting of the ancient city of manhattos at which were present many of its sagest and most illustrious burghers the narrator was a pleasant shabby gentlemanly old fellow in pepper and salt clothes with a sadly humorous face and one whom i strongly suspected of being poor he made much efforts to be entertaining when his story was concluded there was much laughter and approbation particularly from two or three deputy aldermen who had been asleep the greater part of the time there was however one tall dry-looking old gentleman with beetling eyebrows who maintained a grave and rather severe face throughout now and then folding his arms inclining his head and looking down upon the floor as if turning a doubt over in his mind he was one of your wary men who never laugh but upon good grounds when they have reason and the law on their side when the mirth of the rest of the company had subsided and silence was restored he leaned one arm on the elbow of his chair and sticking the other akimbo demanded with a slight but exceedingly sage motion of the head and contraction of the brow what was the moral of the story and what it went to prove the story-teller who was just putting a glass of wine to his lips as a refreshment after his toils 
paused for a moment, looked at his inquirer with an air of infinite deference, and lowering the glass slowly to the table, observed that the story was intended most logically to prove that there is no situation in life but has its advantages and pleasures, provided we will but take a joke as we find it. That, therefore, he that runs races with goblin troopers is likely to have rough riding of it. Ergo, for a country schoolmaster to be refused the hand of a Dutch heiress is a certain step to high preferment in the state. The cautious old gentleman knit his brows tenfold closer after this explanation, being sorely puzzled by the ratiocination of this syllogism, while methought the one in pepper and salt eyed him with something of a triumphant leer. At length he observed that all this was very well, but still he thought the story a little on the extravagant. There were one or two points on which he had his doubts. Faith, sir, replied the storyteller, as to that matter, I don't believe one half of it myself. D. K. End of Section 7 the Legend of Sleepy Hollow, Part 3 Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida End of Selected Classics of Washington Irving By Washington Irving